Welcome to Conspiracy Fact Up Press. Today we're here for another great interview with Dylan, the map maker. He is here today to explain his cult of ball map. Uh, how are you doing today, Dylan? Hey, good. Good to be back. So, Colta Bale, would you like to uh, explain just about the basic uh, name and, and what this map overview is about? Like, it seemed to me to be mostly a, a map of the satanic and human sacrificing or um, cannibalistic different death groups um, that are all kind of correlated and a map of negative history, basically. That's pretty much exactly what it is. It is a map of, um, for one thing, human sacrifice, so the history of human sacrifice, but it's also a map of the elites who are occultists and practice a form of Satanism that has many different names. And so this is showing the different names throughout history, um, the different societies they've infiltrated, uh, the different names of the secret societies they've created, and yeah, <laughs> going all the way back. To the, to the Canaanites on this version. The earlier version, it went back to the pharaohs, but this one goes back even further to the Canaanites. So why don't you start there then uh, with the Canaanites? Well, actually, let me just maybe explain first um, how this kind of came to be. So it was during my research for the Q-Web. Um, when I started the Q-Web, I really was mainly familiar with 20th century conspiracies. And so before I released the first version of that, I had to do a lot of research on conspiracies that happened before the 21st century, or sorry, the 20th century. Um, so yeah, researching back into like the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and like ancient, ancient times. So when I wanted to revise the Q-Web after I initially, initially released it, and I had a lot more information that other people had given me input on. Um, I had to do like an intensive research on this early period, and I was trying to get straight, like the main thing I was trying to track down going back to the earliest times was like how the elite in modern day society ended up with this like occult religion that is very much like Satanism, what a lot of people call it. Um, so just tracing them back, basically tracing back, you know, the, the tip of the power structure back through time um, through the different religions that have been created and the different wars and the different power grabs from one group to another um, to try to find like a consistent, thread basically a thread of power you know it's not one society that dies and the next one just comes out of nowhere like what's actually happened is that the elites of that previous society have actually become the power in the next society so you know a lot of people think the pharaohs are gone but it's basically the same people or the same definitely bloodline um but also you know the same pot of gold they've been dipping their hands into the same pot of gold for two thousand years yeah, it seems to be that they infiltrate the next one before they burn down the last uh, kingdom they, they created. Yeah, I mean, sometimes they're forced to take on a new name or move on to a different society because too many people find out about the one. And so that one gets a bad name and then the people throw them out of power. And uh, they just go underground for a while and come back and un under another name. So... So this research started in a, a different map called the Sephiroth map of the Pharaonic Death Cult, which came out in about March. And that was just basically a simplified version of the Cult of Baal. Um, I don't know if whoever's doing the video wants to like maybe pull, like roll up and pull that one up, the Sephiroth map. It's the same structure in the middle. It's just, um, it doesn't have any of that information in the side margins. So when, when I released that one, I feel like people uh, didn't really fully get like the thesis. I mean, I kind of did an essay with it too, but they didn't really realize like how much information was actually on there, like the, the full extent of that timeline I was trying to show. So I'd always intended to do another version that was expanded and had all the information in the margins um, for people to just jump into the margin and read about those bullet points that had originally been just in the central structure. So do you guys remember ever seeing that one in April? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. It was you just yeah, uh, was, you just released yeah. a previous update on the Q Web too, right? Yeah, that definitely. Was that was when the Q Web first started having um, the ancient section like fully developed, the ancient and medieval section like fully developed around the time when I released the Sephiroth map. 
your sidelines and write your margins, uh, filled in with all the uh, stuff that made it today's map, the cult of ball. Yeah, there's always been a sort of short essay that went with the Sephiroth map that you can get on, well, now it's on page two of the PDF. I guess there wasn't always even a PDF to go with it, but um, it's now the Sephiroth map is a PDF where you can read an essay on page two, and that's also on the Sephiroth page of my personal website. Um, so just to sort of explain my website structure really briefly is my main website is deepstatemappingproject.com, which you'll find the very first thing is the free downloads. And, you know, we've got the QWeb, I think the QKey, which is the color version, the Sephiroth map, the Cult of Bale map. Um, so you can get uh, PDFs of all of those and the essays on page two of that Sephiroth map one. Now, in addition to that, <laughs> if you want to dig deeper, uh, um, and the info tab of the navigation bar on deepstatemappingproject.com is where you will find the other individual pages I've created for these artworks. So actually each one has their own page. There's a page for the QWeb, a page for the Sephiroth map, and a page for the Cult of Bale map. And you'll find that essay again on the Sephiroth maps like website. And there's also a lot of other information on there, like uh, pictures of my development process and um, early versions of the artwork, and, like different components of the artwork. And the Cult of Bale website actually even has a bibliography, which is <laughs> really new for me because, you know, with my cube, everyone's asking me like what my sources and stuff. And so finally for this one, I actually did give my sources and, you know, some of its books, a lot of its articles I found online, definitely some Wikipedia. And then there's a few, uh, well, there's one YouTube video that I would say is really was almost even the inspiration for this, which I think Bibbidi was mentioning earlier, or um, I think that was Retango. <laughs> oh, sorry, just Tango, um, which was Chat Zafrat's The Pharaoh Show. Has anyone seen that one? I think Tango's seen that. <laughs> So yeah, that's definitely, I think, an important video to watch just because it basically is a guy in Switzerland who goes around Switzerland looking at the architecture and the symbols on, on the walls in the stone and just basically pointing out how there's so much Egyptian symbolism in Switzerland. And he's really done his history homework and he knows basically that that is like why that they have this Egyptian symbolism is because they are descendants from the pharaohs and it's that power structure that started with the pharaohs that is in charge of Switzerland today and using Switzerland as its global headquarters and that using basically America as its what I call a pharaonic proxy army so that's in a nutshell like the string of connections going back to the pharaohs. I mean, we're going to go through, I think, the individual points too in between there, but that's generally like the thesis of how, you know, the pharaoh structure got to be controlling the USA today. So Dylan, um, now that we can uh, kind of break down and see with your whole map um, that the, these, uh, these prior power structures, or even if you want to call it one power structure as a whole, basically kind of, uh, you know, tampered down to each individual arm or finger, if you want to call it that, um, now that we can kind of see this and understand it in a visual sense, um, I think it's really important at this time because um, you see right now the breaking away of the Catholics and, and the Catholic Church and what's going on inside the Catholic Church. And so we're going to have a huge population of people trying to understand what they have been suppressed. Uh, you know, they, they have this information been suppressed from them forever. And so what would you do as, as the map maker? to try to ease them into um, understanding um, this power structure as a whole and, and not just blaming, you know, uh, what, ex what exists now, but what has existed for thousands and thousands of years. Well, this map definitely isn't like the, the, um, the soft way to explain it to people. Um, you know, definitely people who are Catholic because this map is kind of giving you like the full disclosure in one place and, um, like you were saying, you know, it's trying to show a very complicated progression of power on on a you know all on one piece of paper in a simple format. So um, sometimes when people look at this, you know, they just understand it immediately, and it's pretty shocking to their faith. Actually, um, you know, probably may, I would say maybe worse so for Catholics, but maybe not worse so 
for Catholics if they're really stubborn, you know, they just don't even really want to read it or read into it. But I've definitely had a few people who have looked at this and been like, wait, uh, <laughs> so like, is God real? Like, does God exist? And I'm like, well, that's not, you know, the question I'm trying to answer with this. Like, I'm just investigating history. But, you know, when you see that it, basically the Vatican is evil or like satanic at the core, at the very highest level, um, you know, you have to accept that that organization is at the core. And I mean, if people, obviously not everyone believes in what the highest level believe in, but you know, if that's who's controlling them, it's like their belief system has been manipulated by these evil ones. So it does t take into question, you know, who, you know, if, if their beliefs are true or not, because they have been corrupted at the core and there might be a different interpretation of their beliefs that's true, but that's like what they'll need to seek next, as opposed to having the confirmation be through, say, the Vatican. And it kind of presents a problem for Protestants as well, because, you know, Protestantism arose as a response to the Vatican, the Vatican's harshness during the Inquisition. But, um, you know, the thing with Protestant is that it's sort of based on the same version of Catholicism or Christianity that Catholicism was. It wasn't, it didn't go back to before Catholicism and take one of these early versions of Christianity that the Vatican had exterminated. It just basically took the, the Vatican version of Christianity and removed the Pope and a few other parts of the power structure. So it was intended to be an improvement, but it's really sort of the same church that the Vatican started. And, you know, but like what I was saying, going back to before the Vatican, what I was referring to was like what you would call like the Gnostics, which is like pre, pre Vatican Christianity, um, or at least a part of it, there was different sects, but the Gnostics were one of the main groups of like pre Vatican Christians who, had very different belief system than the Vatican while they were still followers of Jesus. But then the Vatican came into power and sort of re rewrote their books or t took a different selection of books. Um, what I mean by that is basically taking out certain books like the Book of Enoch, um, books that they found with the Nag Hammadi scriptures in Israel in like the 1950s were very different from the, the Bible, which included the Old Testament that the Vatican uses as the Christian Bible. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you actually, you know, make a good point that we can take that and we can kind of put that into, you know, whatever religious slot that we want. I mean, we could include like Jehovah's Witness. We could include all these different arms, if you will, because um, they're just offshoots. Yeah, well, and some of, some of those offshoots, like I've heard Mormonism, is even strongly linked to like Freemasonry and like some of these offshoots are even just very directly like more um, evil sort of manifestations on like a, on a smaller scale. So one thing I want to, well, I just want to maybe read like, maybe just like the first couple sentences from the Seferet, Seferet map essay, because it kind of, there, there's a few important points that need to be made about this. Is that cool? Go for it. Absolutely, bro. So yeah, reading from this Sephiroth Maps essay, which is on the back of the PDF and on the website for the Sephiroth on DylanLewisMonroe.com, it's uh, the Sephiroth map is a, follows the evolution of an occult belief system that relishes in human war, or sorry, human sacrifice and war, and uses banking as a tool for global domination. Now that's a really important point because on sort of, the second half of this map, or even really more like the last quarter of the map, the progression of power is directly linked to the moving of the biggest bank in the world. And I'm jumping ahead a little bit. I just want to explain that point because it's one of the most important points on here is the banking that was developed by the Templars. Then after the Templars were defeated in the Holy Land at the end of the Crusades, they went back and founded Switzerland. Now, shortly after that, in, like the banking capital of the world was established in Northern Italy, Florence, which is very near Switzerland. Like in those days, the border between Switzerland and Italy was always moving and was very fluid. So theoretically, those same people who had learned banking during the Crusades founded that those first banks in Florence. Then the banking capital, you'll see this actually if you're on the map, this is 
right to the left of the word Masons on that node Masons in the bottom left. The banking capital of the world moved from Florence to then Hamburg, Germany, to then the Amsterdam's, or sorry, the Netherlands, Amsterdam, and then to London, and then way later to back to Switzerland, like the main place where it had originated from with the Bank of International Settlements. That's further on the timeline. But so actually, I just jumped ahead like really bad just then because I'm still trying to read like the first like three sentence of the introduction. No, you're good. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're doing good. So jumping back to the introduction, um, it's really important for me to say that this is not a reinterpretation of the Kabbalah tree of life. It's designed to reference key ideas within the nodes, or it's designed to reference key ideas graphically. That's why it's the shape of the Sephirot, but it's not a reinterpretation of whatever. I'm not even a student of Kabbalah or like, you know, any other type of like new age tree of life teachings. I just study history pretty much. And I mean, I study the religion some, but I don't get into really like learning the different religions, you know, because I'm not trying to like become it <laughs> so yeah you're just taking like an you're just taking an element of uh some of the history and you're using it to kind of inform people like what it is actually you're you're kind of using it to kind of wake people up and try to uh, make them question like what is this this shape what is this figure you know what i mean and then they kind of have to look it up and understand what it is exactly yeah i mean it is definitely the cabal is a really important point on here because you know, we say the elite are satanic, but part of that is that, you know, this is one of the most important books, I think, within that belief system is the Kabbalah. And I think that they're using using it for black magic, basically. And there's there's more to that that I'll get to. But part of this satanic elite is that the Kabbalah is one of the things that one of the main things that they practice and that they draw power and like occult knowledge from. So what it is, as I just said, it's not the tree of life. What it is, is a timeline, a very straightforward timeline that goes from early at the top to present, or not present day, but up to, well, actually close to present day at the bottom. So it's just just a timeline vertically down the piece of paper. And the two nodes that are parallel to each other um, on the different rows are around the same time period or, or close. So I just wanted to show that because that's basically where my notes started. You know, I was trying to show like a timeline that was going down through times, like starting with the Canaanites and basically at the end getting to, well, I don't even get to the USA on the hand-drawn version, but, you know, getting down to the modern secret societies we have today. And then from there, I digitized that and did more, a little bit more refined and complex version with just text. And at that point was when I really saw, like when I was looking at that digitized version, I saw that Sephiroth shape. And I was like, oh, well, isn't that convenient <laughs> for me to just use that shape as the, as the shape of the whole timeline power progression? And so that's how the Sephiroth map came out as a Sephiroth. Sorry, I take a drink of water. Um, so what drives you? What makes you so interested in history? What is your what int- what piqued your interest? Um, I mean, obviously Q, right? We we all know that's why we're here to begin with. But I mean, what drives you to um, try to 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 uh, educate the masses? What's your what's your main thing about history? What, what do you think it can can do to to impact everything? Well, for this one, it's definitely trying to prove the point that the elite are not the religion they're claiming to be and that the reason why the world is the way it is is because we have people in charge who enjoy human sacrifice. And the, that satanic elite thing is one of the hardest red pills for people to swallow because, you know, everyone's heard that JFK was assassinated or that maybe like even that 9-11 was an inside job. But for a lot of people, just like even the notion that our elites could be lying about their religion is like, no, that's impossible. No, no, no. <laughs> so um, that's really what, like was the main point of proving like how a religion, like an evil religion could have gotten infiltrated into the highest level today. Well, we've seen, you know, Barack Obama or Barry Sotero have trouble keeping his religion straight on camera where he, we know he's a Muslim uh, and wears a ring that talks about Allah, but that he's been 
Fuck was it? Yeah, definitely. Um, and Islam t- definitely ties into all of this like very strongly. And actually, what I was what I was going to say before it's funny you brought up Barry Sotero or Barack Obama because, um, you know, one of my friends who's like halfway into conspiracies and knows about a few things. Like I was talking to her on the phone and trying to explain like the full picture to her and like trying to bring her up to speed on some of this. And she was just like, no, Obama's a nice guy. Um, Like he would never, like he can't be satanic. (laughs) And like saying the same thing about Beyonce. And I was just like, um, uh, sorry to break it to you. Like gotta finish this map and then you'll understand. (laughs) But yeah, it's like, you know, people, these, you know, a lot of these people who are, actually satanists or evil are actors and so that's their job to sort of deceive you um and that is, it includes the politicians um hopefully not trump <laughs> yeah so this map will really show you the whole progression and like how it's possible that evil could have gotten this far and and giving you examples all throughout history of this human sacrifice that's really completely unnecessary um in our society. It's really like a, a scourge on our society. I was just listening to Ivana, Ivanka Trump speak today about human trafficking and how it's like a scourge on the modern world and it's bad. And it really is. And what she's talking about with this human trafficking is what's going on the behind the scenes here. The secret human sacrifices that are going on, both human sacrifices and just uh, human trafficking for, for sexual stuff. But you know, she's definitely referring to this going on behind the scenes. And so that was cool to see her give a speech about that just today. Yeah, we absolutely see that. And we absolutely do know that here at conspiracyfact.press. But um, we can also see around the world that the the squeeze is on, that um, these networks are getting shut down. These rat lines are getting figured out and found out by authorities. And um, we can see that it's happening, you know, that there is a, a kibosh getting put on all of these uh, these human sacrifice rings and um, all these evil networks going on around the globe. Yeah, amen. And I mean, it would seem that Trump is responsible for that. So I really think he's sort of an antidote to this old power system. But I think this is the time when people, for people to understand what has happened and really understand the full history. That's the important history that's relevant to the world today and relevant to the power structure, not, you know, what we learned in high school, which was that, that America is just always the savior in World War II and the Civil War, like we're always on the right. <laughs> so I think, should we like maybe look at the Cult of Bale map and I'll sort of tell you guys the basics on like how to explore it, how to read it. I mean, I've already told you it's a timeline, but there's just a couple of things that necessitate a little explanation. So. So the first thing to see on here is um, at the very top of that Sephiroth shape, those two sort of platforms that stick out of it. I'm not even really sure what they are. They're kind of like little horns, but they're kind of like like Greek platforms, landing platforms maybe, of these, these uh, Sumerian gods that landed and gave us this religion. <laughs> so you've got on the left Baal worship and on the right human sacrifice. And so that's sort of the core of this, the core of this, uh, the cult of Baal. And actually on the Sephiroth version of this, it said Baal worship and cannibalism. And the reason why it was that specifically was because when you take the word Canaanites and add on Baal worship or just Baal, you get the word cannibal. And that's how the word cannibal came from. And it's because some of these Canaanites, I'm not saying all of them, but some of them were cannibals. Um, actually, while we're on that, <laughs> while we're on that note, um, a very important disclaimer for this entire map is that, let's see, let me find <laughs> the line where I explained it best. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that each of these groups has mostly good people in it. It's just this elite, the top, I would say 1%, maybe even like 1% of the 1% that are guiding this whole thing. And it's the same way they're guiding the entire population. So obviously, you know, there's good people in all these organizations and um, it's really just actually the leaders, maybe not even the only leaders, but the leaders who 
manage to stay in power that are the evil ones that are practicing this human sacrifice and that are like really into the Baal worship. So is that clear that, you know, I'm not like insinuating that for especially like the Masons really take offense to this because they're like, well, we don't worship Lucifer because I have the Luciferian caption on there. But uh, their leader or their one of their most famous authors of the Freemasons, Albert Pike, did write that they worship Lucifer at the 33rd degree. So that's like, you know, a very small percentage of Masons. And I think that's the 33rd degree of only the Scottish Rite as well. So any Blue Lodge Masons, like, never going to hear about this Luciferianism and any, um, I'm, not even, I'm not sure about this, but probably not even Yorkish, right? I think it's really only the Scottish, right, that was the, the branch of Freemasonry that was infiltrated by this power structure. So let's understand that. There's, there, you know, there's more research to do to figure out, like, which, which of these people were in, infiltrated. Like, sometimes it's written here, like, um, but it's not always completely clear. And I don't want it to seem like I'm saying everyone in this whole society was like a Baal worshiper or like a, a Satanist. So hopefully that's clear. Definitely. We know most of these people are good people, um, especially through, you know, Masons. They're just um, people there looking for a kind of brotherhood um, or something like that. Uh, <sighs> Definitely. So, um, so the, so the important thing to know about how to read this map is that you basically take one of those words from the central structure, from the central sephirot, um, whether it's in inside a circle or whether it's in a, um, a connection or whether it's one of the words outside the circle, the big words. And then you go to the side that it corresponds to. So if it's on the left, you go to the left. If it's on the right, you go to the right. If it's in the center, you might have to go a little bit on both sides or it might be more of one or the other, but the central points, I just had to basically pick a side that made more sense. But so you go to the side and then you'll find the same word written in a bold font. And depending on which version of of this you're looking at, um, the bold fonts may be more or less noticeable, but um, when you really get up close, you can really tell the difference between the bold and the normal font and it's all they're all bold and the same size as well that are the terms that correspond to the main structure so what you would do is you you find a term you want to find on the main structure then you go to the side and you find the bold term and then around the bold term is what i've written about the the main term and so you'll find like a little bit of description it's actually even a little bit more descriptive than the cube web at times so i do get into some you know kind of like mini sentences but i just basically try to give you like the most important points that i've researched about that term that i that i can think of and also there are a few other terms in those side margins that maybe not necessarily directly related to the term on the center but is an important point in terms of the timeline and i mean it is related in some way to the term on the center Um, But there are some, there is definitely gets into even more um, explanation and historical bullet points than just like the terms on the center. And you'll probably, like once you look through like a section, you'll probably be able to understand like how it's related, how everything's related. So yeah, it just, um, so the, the first term up there at the top is Canaanites. (laughs) I'm just going to get into a little, like what I would like to do I'm not sure how we are on time, but like what I would like to do is just kind of go briefly over each of the terms on the main structure and then let's say like the most important connections or the most important points between them, the strongest maybe. Drop drop some knowledge, bro. So the Canaanites, the most important thing here is that is the early Canaanites were the Sumerians. You see that on the right and the later Canaanites were the Phoenicians. So Actually, a lot of the terms on this chart are kind of confusing about, like, is this, a, is this a society? Is this a people? Is this a geographic region? And for the Canaanites, I think that term actually comes from the Bible, but it mainly refers to a geographic region. So we're talking about kind of Israel and like the Middle East. You could, in, in, in the early days, you would call those all Canaanites. And so that's why it's saying like to the right, Canaanites were considered Sumerians very early on by historians, let's say. And so that's connected with the whole like Sumerian pantheon, which I'm sure a lot of people now, nowadays have heard of actually some of these Sumerian gods like Enki and Enlil. 
so like the theme kind of throughout this whole chart is that basically all religions trace back to these original Sumerian gods and Ki and Enlil and like their whole um, pantheon from that Sumerian period. And I think even I think even you can pretty much compare compare Baal to en, um, Enlil because Enlil was sort of the more like warish um, storm one, and that's sort of what developed as Baal. I think that the the name Baal actually developed a little bit later than the Sumerians, but Baal is basically would be com comparable to Enlil from the Sumerians. So then. <laughs> I guess from Sumerian culture, you go through Egyptian culture, and then the later Sumerians you could call Phoenicians. Phoenicians refers to a civilization that basically lived around the rim of the Mediterranean, and there was a seafaring people. So that can be kind of confusing. <laughs> I mean, it was confusing to me because I pretty much knew who Sumerians were. I knew like they lived in Mesopotamia like really a long time ago. And I pretty much knew who Egyptians were because they, you know, obviously lived in Egypt and they have all those landmarks, the pyramids that you can recognize as that's where their culture was. The Phoenicians are kind of confusing because they were more of a seafaring people and their, their culture was spread over the whole rim of the Mediterranean, which is all different countries now. So it's really a region that, you know, you have to see on a map that's specifically drawn because now it's all completely di divided up into different countries and it's kind of hard to think of one culture just being scattered cities around that whole ring but they sort of just ruled the sea and were the mediterranean people and they were the first ones who really well maybe not the first ones but their culture was really centered on the worship of baal and for them they had a little bit of a different name for him which was baal hamon and that's actually even after a lot of this Egyptian history, but <laughs> the timeline, you know, it jumps a little bit to get the definitions in the right place of, to refer to Canaanites, you know, they were originally Sumerians. And then there's a lot of cultures that went through that region, to be honest. I mean, this is quite a, a big summary, but in the late period of the Egyptians, they were called the Phoenicians from this region and in the sea and around the Mediterranean. So that's who the Canaanites were. Tribe of Dan, um, a lot of people say that the Antichrist will be coming from the tribe of Dan. Um, I'm still a little bit unclear on exactly like if you could call these people the tribe of Dan or is tribe of Dan basically says like the, the evil portion of God's people of like the Israelites, but like the lost ones. What have I written here? So <laughs> I, I say tribe of Dan, I jump to the bull tribe of Dan. It says pagan tribe of the Antichrist. And the Bible says that they they were into like the golden calf worshiping, which in Exodus, you know, you might remember like while Moses is taking the Ten Commandments, the the his people, the Hebrews, supposedly down at the bottom of the hill, start worshiping the golden calf again because <laughs> they get a little bit confused about who their God is and they start reverting back to their original ways of worshiping a golden calf, which is a reference to Baalism. But so that's that's what you can think of as the tribe of Dan. So it's what's what gets a little bit confusing on this map, um, which is why I made it to explain this, is that there's names and terminology that all come out of the Bible. And that's kind of what Canaanites tribe of Dan, King Solomon is from. And then there's a whole different set of names that come out of mainstream historians. So that's why I'm saying, you know, Canaanites are actually Sumerians and Phoenicians. Um King Solomon will get to. <laughs> uh, a tribe of Dan, you know, I don't think there's really a term for that from like mainstream historians, but I think I've explained it to you guys like pretty decently. So are you guys ready for, ready for the next row? <laughs> Let's do it, bro. So pharaohs. In, in Egyptian mythology, the first pharaoh is Osiris. Now this kind of contradicts mainstream historians say pretty much the first pharaoh was Menes. That's neither here nor there, but pretty much, so Osiris was actually like a god in Egyptian mythology, and they considered him to be the first pharaoh, even though it's, at least mainstream historians have not like admitted that um, Osiris was a historical pharaoh or not, but that's what their belief system was. And the legends of Osiris are pretty much analogous to the legends of Nimrod in the Bible. And then the legends of Nimrod in the Bible 
are somewhat analogous to Gilgamesh in the Sumerian mythology. So, like I said, like there's going to be a theme on here of everything like tying back to Sumerian mythology. Even even the biblical stories have parallels in Sumerian mythology. And that's like the oldest religion. And I mean, maybe this actually should have been called the cult of Enlil, but <laughs> for some reason, like that Baal seems to be more appropriate than Enlil because I'm not even sure if Enlil to Baal is like a really direct connection. Because, you know, some of these gods have very similar traits but they also have some different traits and basically they follow a similar archetype. And so you'll have an archetype of say a storm God that goes just from one culture to the next. And so that's why the names are analogous because they're all the storm God. But then in one culture, it might be the God of storm and war and another culture, it might be the God of say I don't know, well, storm and just storm or storm and desert actually. Um, so an important note about the pharaohs, since we're here. Actually, you know what? Let me just break for one second. I think I'm jumping ahead too much before I really explained overall the map. Is that okay? Sorry to switch gears, but um, I just want to jump down to explain like the deity chart really quick because I kind of just you're great going down one avenue, like one like a Christianity avenue or a, a Greek uh, god belief. You're going down, you know, to the to the root, the the basic structure of it all. Exactly. Yeah. I just wanted to jump ahead, like break off the timeline really quick and just t tell you briefly that at the bottom of the diagram is what we call the deity chart. And it's sort of separate from the, that layout I was explaining of the, the terms in the middle corresponding to the margins. So the deity chart is at the very bottom. And I think um, if Bibbidi wants to pull up that, that like long horizontal picture that I posted below the black and white picture, it's a close-up of the deity chart from the poster version, which is actually a little more expanded and um, thorough and makes more sense than the one on the, the eight and a half by 11 piece of paper or um, JPEG. I'm looking for it and looking for it. <laughs> I'm not seeing it. It was the last one I posted in the string of like the main images I posted for this. It's like the hand drawn, the, the black and red Sephiroth, the black and white um, called to bail, and then this long sort of gray. Uh, finally gray. Got, yep, I finally right. got it. it yeah, great. so that's the deity chart. And what I came to with this is that there's basically a male archetype of this storm god, and there's like a female archetype of. I don't want to say necessarily his wife, but like I'd say like the main female goddess of the culture. And so it's it basically for the female, it goes through like Inanna, Ishtar, Isis, Aphrodite, Venus. And then that corresponds to um, Sumerian, Egyptian, Greek, Roman. And then on the up, other side, the, the masculine deity, it says Baal, Moloch, Set, Zeus, Jupiter, and actually, Zeus and Jupiter could also, you could consider that to be Saturn and Cronus. Um, I'm not sure what makes more sense to put in that row, but it's, it's, it's the chief masculine deity and the storm deity of all those cultures. But then a lot of people more like, you know, Greek and Roman cultures had so many gods that I think these roles like a little bit overlapped. And so you could also tie um, Cronus instead of Zeus and Saturn instead of Jupiter as this chief um, sort of the one that connects back to the archetype of like the Satan archetype. So back to the female side, the reason why that says Lucifer is because Venus is considered the morning star and Lucifer is also said in the Bible to be the morning star, um, which corresponds to Venus. So a lot of people, you know, visualize Lucifer as a masculine deity but it actually falls into the archetype of the feminine deity um, for a number of reasons. Whereas Satan is corresponds to the masculine deities, like connects back to Baal, Moloch, Set. I think, you know, even the name Set. Well, the name Set has been confirmed to correspond with Satan for one thing, because um, Michael Aquino, that military psyops dude <laughs> in the 1970s, started the temple of set as like a form of satanism so right there you can understand that 
set, this Egyptian god set, is the one that corresponds to Satan. Um, because like that was definitely like a satanic temple, like temple of set was basically like another arm of the church of Satan, which Anton LaVey founded in the sixties. You guys heard of him? The OTO, right? Oh, OTO is another sort of like satanic secret society. Yeah. I think they were probably both members, right? Probably. I know. Um, and, or, um, Oh, never mind. But yeah, set corresponds to Satan, like for sure. And so, yeah, I don't want to get into deity tart tart too much right now, but just to know that that's a different section down there. And then you have um, to the upper right of that, like the legend of the diagram, which just tells you like the little symbols, like what they mean. And um, I have a little cross, which stands for human sacrifice, like a little I think it's like a nine-pointed star that stands for a capital. That means a capital city. Um, usually the capital city of whatever society um, you're looking in the section of. Now, the next one is if you see two terms that have a line in between them, like one on top of the other, that means that it's two terms for the same thing or that they were the same people that have two different names or that they're the same people that existed in two different locations. Then I have a little kind of like lightning bolt that represents a storm God. And then I have just like, obviously like a line with the two little balls on the end represents a connection. And then there's a couple little question marks on here that represent the theories or stuff that I'm not sure about or stuff. I mean, probably no one's completely sure about, but there's a few different theories on here that, you know, I don't want to, presume anything or just you know so there's a few things that you could consider a theory now shall we go back up to pharaohs and continue the timeline all right so pharaohs existed around the same time as babylon and these kings of babylon um, it's sort of at the, actually the top of this diagram, like the, the, the left column sort of represents the West and the right column sort of represents the East is another, it's like kind of geographically divided like that. Um, not so much further down, like once you get to the Masons and the Jesuits, there's not like a geographic divide there, but at the top, it's a little bit of like a, a West and East situation in terms of the timeline. So Babylon is actually the new node that I added after the Sephiroth map. Um, the Sephiroth map ended in pharaohs at the top because I was trying to prove that um, Chat Sephiroth's pharaoh show video thesis that this all goes back to the pharaohs. And, you know, I still think that thesis is true, but there's also a strong influence that came into this cult of Baal or this, you know, the cult that runs the world from Babylon. And I think that the leaders of those societies have kind of merged and like decide to work together to take over humanity pretty much. And both of them go back to the Canaanites because that's just, I mean, Canaanites is sort of a general term for like the earliest culture in that region. And it definitely, there was people in that region before like the, the main Egyptian dynasties that we, that we track as like Egyptian history and Canaanites would include Babylon. So it's just sort of like the early Babylonians. Like I said, like the Canaanites are early Sumerians, later Phoenicians. Um, all right. So thank you. We're asking about the Hyksos, right? Yes, of course. So the Hyksos was the 15th dynasty in Egypt, and they're considered foreign rulers they were foreign invaders of egypt they were a tribe i guess you could call it that came in um from the canaanite region and took over northern egypt and started their own dynasties and they lasted for you know maybe a few hundred years but then they were driven out and some theorists say that the hebrew the hyksos are actually the Hebrews. So that's why you see on the right there, Hebrews above the line Hyksos. So like both, but basically both the theories that are um, reconciling biblical history with historical history, both of the theories 
basically place the Hebrews as being Egyptian dynasties, not just being Egyptian slaves. And so that would be one part of the theory saying that the Hebrews came from the Hyksos. Then the other part of that theory is saying that the Hebrews came from the 21st dynasty, which is the dynasty formed by the priests of the temple. Um, They weren't like a Pharaoh bloodline. They were the priests of the temple that abandoned the Pharaoh and the Pharaonic bloodline and formed their own dynasty, which was the 21st dynasty. And so the reason why people believe that is because there's a lot of parallels between this 21st dynasty of Egypt and the the, um, Hebrew or Jewish stories of the United Kingdom of Israel, which was what what the Bible says is that after Exodus happened, like the slaves left Egypt, Exodus, and then they they fought some wars to, to establish themselves in the Israel region. And then they went into this thing, the United Monarchy, which was the 12 tribes um, becoming one kingdom under these these kings' names, which you've probably heard, like King David, King Solomon. Um, I think King Saul was before King David, maybe. I'm, I'm a little need to brush up on that. One second. Let me swig this water. Um, but yeah, so the 21st dynasty has a lot of parallels to these this united monarchy of Israel. And um, you know what? Let me pull up the name of this book because <laughs> I found one. You know, I was really trying to figure this out for myself. And so I was doing research on different places and I finally found one guy who had written some really good books about that, basically figuring out who these biblical kings really were in in the historical record. Because part of the problem with King Solomon and this story about a united Israel and these biblical kings is that there are zero artifacts. And there's like one artifact that's like a shard of rock with cuneiform on it that uh, scholars say has the word King Solomon on it. Um, But for one thing, you know, you're taking a scholar's word for it, (laughs) that they translated it from just anything. And for two, it's a little bit odd that that's like the only physical record of what would have been King Solomon's temple, because King Solomon basically built the first temple of, of the Jewish religion, or like the first central, maybe like main one, you know, maybe they had like little houses or something before that they practiced in, but he's recognized as having built like the first temple. And it's weird that we haven't found like much historical evidence of it. I mean, people say like they're digging all around like Temple Mount because that's where it's supposed to be according to the Bible. They're digging all around there, like trying to find stuff and then saying that like the Muslims are impeding like their digging efforts and that, you know, they're just being sabotaged by the Muslims. But there's, you know, there's evidence that that's where the second temple was, but because the Romans had documented that but there's really no evidence of that having ever had like a first temple other than stories. So some, like the author of this book that I found, let me pull up his name. It's, uh, uh, I still can't find the author's name. It's on my Amazon, but I don't want to take it too long. Um, maybe we can link it in the description of the, of the video. But yeah, his theory was that this 21st dynasty of Egypt, which had its capital, like this is the priest that left the main Egypt, which was down at um, Car- the Temple of Karnak, which is the lo- city of Luxor. They left the the Egyptian pharaohs and started their own dynasty in a city called Tanis. Now, the interesting thing about Tanis is that it's way in northern Israel. I would even say like northeast Israel, basically like as close to, or sorry, not Israel, Egypt. <laughs> is in Northeast Egypt, as close to Israel as you can get. So geographically, you can kind of see how maybe like these two got confused because it was, you know, in that they were both sort of in the same region. Um, So that's one theory is that the original King Solomon's temple was a temple in Tanis run by the 21st Egyptian dynasty. That's one theory. And from the research I've done, that's like the best I could come up with in terms of like really figuring it out. But yeah, that's up, you know, it still could use a little more research. So then it's clear that, well, in biblical history, and I think there's also a, a physical record that 
Nebuchadnezzar from the Babylonians conquered that whole region, whether they were Egyptians or whether they were Hebrew Israelis, um, Nebuchadnezzar conquered that whole region. And then in the Bible, that's what's referred to as the Babylonian captivity. When, when the original Hebrews were supposedly taken to Babylon and kept in captivity and the temple of King Solomon was destroyed. Uh, by the way, just like a, a preface, King Solomon is definitely important to all of this because that's um, who the Freemasons base all of their lodges off of. So I didn't just pick King Solomon out of like, out of a hat. as like, you know, this is the most important guy to put on here. Like this is, I'm getting, I know he's important because the Freemasons consider him so important. And so that's part of the reason why I did so much investigating into King Solomon specifically was because every Masonic temple is based on Solomon's temple. So, you know, and like their two pillars have um, symbolic meaning based on King Solomon. Um, so that's why I was really digging into King Solomon so hard. So I was like, why are the Freemasons like obsessed with him? And it actually kind of makes sense that if he was actually one of these Egyptian pharaohs, because um, also in Freemasonry, you see this like obsession with ancient Egypt. And, um, you know, if the Hebrews had escaped these, their oppressors, the Egyptians, and then, you know, gone on and evolved into Christianity and then um, gone and evolved, evolved, evolved into the Freemasons, you know, why would you want to be putting like your oppressors, like if you, like your slave masters symbols, like all over your own like um decorations and lodges or whatever so that's why i was really digging into like you know you see the pyramid on the dollar bill um so it's like why are we like still obsessed with the egyptians when they were supposedly just like slave masters to us and it's because <laughs> they weren't just like we like these elites were the egyptians they weren't just they didn't escape from the egyptians like that's part of this whole um it's part of this victim story that lets them get away with what they're doing is that you know it starts off with the story of the hebrews escaping from a slave master the egyptians um so automatically you feel like these people deserve um to be treated nicely, you know, because they were they were slaves and they escaped. And so, you know, you want good things for them. But like the it seems that the truth is that they were really just a a dynasty or multiple dynasties, possibly the Hyksos and the 21st dynasty, the priests of Karnak, which both those dynasties failed and were driven out of Egypt or were conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. So it just gives you a very different perspective of history that, you know, we didn't come from the underdog. We came from like the, the attack dog. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? A hundred percent. The conquerors. Yeah. Like, I mean, the Hyksos were the invaders, not the, well, nobody says that the Hyksos weren't the invaders, but definitely like the Hebrews aren't considered to be the invaders, but then, so the, like the working theory, I just want to say again, it, the working theory that I have now at this point is that, the Hebrews were composed of, first of all, the Hyksos, who, who left Egypt after they invaded, and then later were joined by, or maybe were conquered by, these Karnak priests that formed the 21st dynasty, and then all of them were conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, while these supposed Hebrews were in Babylonian captivity in Babylon, um, you know, the temple of King Solomon had been destroyed, this is in the year uh, 600 BC or 589 is when they were conquered. So keep in mind, a lot of them are illiterate. There's probably only a handful of copies of the actual scriptures. So if their temple is obliterated, it's unclear if even the scriptures would have made it to Babylon, especially if they were under like a religious persecution as well. So the Bible says that a copy, I think, did make it to Babylon, that it was held by Ezra, who was um, one of the last priests, or um, what would you call it? What do you call a Jewish priest? Rabbi? <laughs> yeah, one of the last rabbis of King Solomon's temple before it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. So supposedly Ezra took the Torah to Babylon and then um, either re like rewrote it, or maybe he actually rewrote it in Babylon from memory is... I'm not sure exactly what the Bible says that happened, but either he had like the last remaining copy 
or he rewrote it from memory. So that brings up the question of whether <laughs> whether Ezra was like a spy working for this Babylonian king <laughs> that he just wanted him to like create a religion for these Canaanites and then bring it back to Israel or the Canaanite region and say, you know, we were your relatives, like this was your religion and we're back to save you basically. That's I want I wondered that when I was doing this. I was like, if he did this from like if he came up with this whole Torah from memory, like who's to say that he was even like one of the original Hebrews that left? <laughs> so that's an interesting theory, because then we're getting back to the return of the Jews. So Cyrus the Great was the I guess you would call king of the Babylonians. Um, at the time when the Jews were allowed to return back to Zion, which which is the the Israel area, and that's that's when you begin the Judea Second Temple period. So basically, what this what this chart is saying is that it's not completely clear that that United Israel monarchy really existed as it, as it's portrayed in the Bible, but that it may have actually been either like the 21st dynasty of Egypt or um, Hyksos people, like uh, sort of like failed dynasties of Egypt that had retreated back into that region. So I got you through to the Judea Second Temple period. This is actually the most confusing part. So if you can follow through this, like we're going to be good for the rest of the chart. <laughs> Go for it, bro. Are you guys still following? Like, I, oh, I yeah. Think- I think I explained that pretty well, but like this whole Hyksos, like the whole like Egyptian Israeli Hyksos thing is really confusing. And it took me a really long time to understand it. And that's, I mean, I don't even, the thing is, it's like, there's no written record, like there's no history. So, I mean, I, it's probably just the sources on like one hand of like what we even know this history from. It's from, you know, like hieroglyphs on certain temples. And then like, obviously you take the Bible as like a possibility but you sort of have to reconcile that with what has been um, discovered archaeologically. Yeah, bro, you you really killing it. Um, dropping knowledge on a lot of stuff that is uh, hard to research and uh, doing pretty well at it. Like uh, summing up a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I almost killed myself researching this, and I was lucky. I had a couple people really help me. Like, um, I had one woman who is a classics major from Australia. That's I don't know if it's obvious, but classics is like the study of like this ancient history. And then another guy from California, um, Mickey Magistus, who I'm, I'm not even sure why he researched this stuff so much. He's like writing a, like a fiction novel, but he knew a lot about this and really like, you know, helped me, guided me to get to like the important bullet points. Like he like really like pushed me to put like research like the Hick sauce. And it is true because like, you know, later in my research, I discovered like whole books about like the Hick sauce and um, so yeah, I was, I was guided by certain people to like go down this, these directions, but then like confirmed it later, like through like whole books and other articles. Um, so I think I have a little bit, I've gotten us down to Judea second temple period on the right, but i um, kind of need to explain a little bit more like what happened with the Pharaohs on the left here and some of the most important points around there. So the Pharaohs, let me, I'm going to jump a little bit, but the most important point about the Pharaohs is that during the 18th dynasty, which is actually considered the new kingdom, it's like kind of what we think about like Egypt in its prime. And now I differ with mainstream archaeologists archaeologists here because, um, you know, they might say Egypt in its prime is when they built the Great Pyramids. But as I'm sure all of we know in this chat and anyone who's watched Ancient Aliens knows that the pyramids were most likely built long before the documented Egyptian dynasties that we consider um, mainstream Egyptian history. So this would be, I guess you could call it the, the golden age of the Egyptians within the last like 5,000 years, because the, the pyramids were probably built a long time before that. And so and the Sphinx as well, even older. So the 18th dynasty is really when we get like the hieroglyphs that we all recognize and definitely um, the temple of Karnak, which is like one of the largest temples in Egypt was built during that period. It was continuously built and every Pharaoh just expanded on this one temple more and more and more. That's why this temple is like multiple football fields, huge. Um, um, This is near the city of Luxor, which is much further South than Cairo and the great pyramids. 
But so we're into the 18th dynasty. There's the 18th, uh, the 18th dynasty is actually who drove out the Hyksos. So the, the 18th dynasty, their first pharaoh kicked the Hyksos out of Egypt. So that's when the Hyksos mm-hmm. left. And that would be when theoretically, possibly, we could consider that to be like Exodus of the Hebrews is the expulsion of the Hyksos. So the 18th dynasty gets going and the important pharaoh to recognize here is actually the pharaoh who was sort of a, how shall I say, (laughs) he was sort of like the black sheep of the 18th dynasty. This dude, Akhenaten, Akhenaten, he um, basically tossed the old religion out and started this new religion called Atonism, which was the first religion, I think, in the world. I'm not sure what's going on in the Far East because I don't really research the Far East quite as much. But I think this is the first religion in the world, Atonism, which was monotheism. And the Aten is the sun disk. And so their symbol of the sun disk was like a disk with little hands emanating out every direction. And this was what you could consider. um, So if you see Akhenaten Atonism in the center there, um, near like to the left of Pharaoh's is his bullet points on the side margin. You could consider this totalitarian monotheism because the old like uh polytheistic religion was outlawed and i think he even started trying to um destroy like the hieroglyphics and like the record of the old religion but didn't get very far but this religion was like you had to practice atonism and he moved like the capital of egypt again to a different city and this was like the city that was the capital of his religion and basically he pissed off all the priests of the old religion because I'm not sure if you would consider them like unemployed, but (laughs) um, they were just like up shit's Creek basically because, you know, they knew this old religion and he's trying to complete, completely change everything. Like you can imagine their dissatisfaction, but he's ending like an entire religion. He's shifting an entire culture in a whole different direction. That's like, Oh, that's completely devastating to a culture, you know? Exactly. I can imagine people weren't too happy with it either. Yeah, exactly. I don't think anyone was very happy with it. But so a few things to note about this Akhenaten, um, the bullet points under him, it says hermaphroditic. So when you look at sculptures of him, he's like, he basically has um, women's hips and like, to see, I think he has like breasts too. Like he's kind of like a little hermaphrodite. And um, so that's kind of unusual. And, you know, some people might say he's kind of like an alien, but like people actually think he had this certain like genetic disorder that makes you have like some feminine traits, even though you're a man. And I only mention that because it sort of ties into the whole Baphomet worship, which comes out later, which is this like hermaphroditic, like goat human. So some of that Baphomet worship might actually be inspired by this pharaoh Akhenaten who sort of started this monotheism and um, he had some of those same features. So, but anyways, he didn't last long. Um, He was, you know, it's not, I haven't really found a clear story of what happened at the end of his reign, but he either died or was overthrown. I don't think he lasted very long. Um, And then the priest basically went right back to the old religion, I think. Um, I'm not sure who actually like the very next ruler was, but in one way or another, like, I don't think it was like his son or it wasn't like his direct bloodline. I think actually his wife ruled afterwards and the priest sort of like took control and reverted Egypt back to the old religion and then actually almost erased every trace of Akhenaten and Atonism. Like they completely destroyed the city he built and he was really almost completely erased from the Egyptian record. And the existence of Akhenaten was only discovered and like revealed to modern, um, the modern world and modern historians. Like, mm, well, I want to say either in like the late 1800s or early 20th century. So, what would were, you say? What would you say, real quick? Real quick. Uh, some people believe and say that Akhenaten was Moses. I mean, you know, it kind of does make sense. What would you say to that? Um, I would say that's a possibility for sure. Like, you know, 
I don't think there's, hmm, there might not be like a direct, there's not like an obvious direct tie to Moses. Like I've definitely seen other suggestions, like not Akhenaten, like I actually have right here. I'll drop a meme in. Now, I'm not following this meme like directly. I think it's important to point out like the uh, correlation of, you know, in the past and cultures. Yeah, definitely. So like this meme, this meme is putting Moses as topmost three who came before Akhenaten, but he was part of that same 18th dynasty. So, you know, I would definitely say that Moses in terms of timeline and, and action or, and, you know, historical achievements does probably tie to one of these pharaohs of the, of the 18th dynasty. This one saying topmost three, um, there's also, I, I felt like there was some sign or some indication that Moses connects back to actually Tutmos IV, which I'm not sure if that's Tutmos III's father or if there's someone in between. But, um, you know, you look at the name Tutmos, there's different spellings of it, for one thing. The way I've spelled it on the Colts of Bell map, um, it's spelled basically Tutmosis. And so you see right there, the similarity phonomically between Moses and Tutmosis. <laughs> and you know, I'm not just making that spelling up. Like that, there's different ways to spell it. No, um, you're, you know, exactly, you're exactly right. And, and it's a good point because if it was uh, an Egyptian pharaoh that was Moses there that, you know, transformed into what we know now as Moses, it would make sense that he would get, you, you know, like pretty much a kingdom so to speak, a smaller kingdom to follow him out into the desert to become, you know, his servants, his, his uh, slaves, if you will, um, and his followers. Yeah, for sure. It was, you know, it's the priesthood of this 18th dynasty that I'm saying could have, or, or that did go and form that 21st dynasty, which I say could possibly be the Israel United Monarchy. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, there's evidence that Mos or the story of Moses could have possibly been inspired partially by Akhenaten, definitely in the sense that um, Akhenaten, you know, formed the first, first monotheistic religion, for sure. And, um, you know, we have these two little images in the middle, the, the Sphinx steel and the tablets of the law. And um, the Sphinx steel, so this blew my mind. So in between the two paws of the Sphinx, is what's called a steel, which is basically, I mean, you can think of it at like a giant gravestone. It's like a big stone slab that Egyptians carve um, a message onto that's either like a historical record of something that happened or, you know, like whatever they want. <laughs> um, and so this, this Sphinx steel has, it's, it's sort of a vague message, but there's different interpretations. But, um, you know, I read a whole article about this and, you know, I think at the deepest level of interpretation of what's written on the Sphinx steel is that, Tutmosis kind of had a vision of monotheism because I think he had a vision where like multiple gods were combined. And so Tutmosis IV was um, Akhenaten's something like great grandfather. And so I think possibly what happened was that, you know, this dude Tutmosis had a vision of all these religions combined, basically the vision of monotheism, put this steel right in between the Sphinx's feet that like outlines outlines this the the origin of this like the conception of this idea and then i think that this religion was practiced within like the elite of this ruling pharaonic family they were practicing atonism for the next few generations and that akhenaten was just the first one who decided to be like make it public and enforce it on everyone else so, I mean, I feel like what I just said made a lot of sense. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, like it could be Moses, but then like Akhenaten was the first one who tried to enforce it. And then since he failed, they sort of had to like back off and like regroup and then like figure out a different way to go about it. So we're tr I'm trying to get you guys like up to the Roman Empire here. And it's, 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 this is one of the hardest jumps between the pharaohs and the Roman Empire because there's a lot of stuff that happened in between. I mean, the pharaoh kingdoms were constantly shifting. Like at times they were invaded by people from the south. That's why everyone says that, oh, the pharaohs were black, you know, but it's like, well, yeah, there were, there were some dynasties that were black, but not, I don't think every dynasty of pharaohs was black because, you know, there was 
Nubian pharaohs and that sort of assimilated to their culture. But then, you know, I don't think that's the main line of power that continued through time. And I mean, there's, there's a lot of very clear ties between the Egyptian pharaohs and like the way the Vatican is set up, especially like not even just the Romans, but like when you look at the Vatican, um, like the, just a lot of the symbolism and like the religious garb, it's very clearly influenced by Egyptian stuff. And so I, you know, I was trying to find the connections between these societies and it's a little bit tough because, you know, in between the pharaohs you have, the Greeks came into power let me just look at this world. <laughs> I have like a world history timeline that's like right next to me because it gets confusing. You know, definitely like the Phoenicians were in there. The Greeks kind of came a little bit after the Phoenicians. And, you know, obviously like the Greeks are in Greece and the Phoenicians were kind of all over. So it's a little, it gets confusing geographically too. And like this history timeline has the Egypt ending with the Persian Empire, which is an, an expansion of Babylon. I mean, Babel, the history of Babylon is probably even more, or just as complicated, if not even more complicated than Egypt, because you have all these different periods like Babylon, Neo-Babylon, Assyrian, like Neo-Assyrian, and then it, it all kind of merges into the Persian Empire. Um, so that's that in a nutshell, but between the pharaohs and the Romans, you know, like I was saying, you had the Phoenicians and then the Greeks. Obviously, like the Romans sort of evolved from the Greeks, or at least like cultural wise, they, you know, were more inspired by the Greeks than the pharaohs. Um, when you look at Greek culture, you see a lot of, you see some Egyptian influence, and you also see some Babylonian influence. So I think, you know, the Greeks were a little bit of a merging of the, the Egyptian and the Babylonian and then the Romans were sort of a refinement on that. But the one very concrete connection I did find between the pharaohs and the Roman Empire was that Julius Caesar, who we've all heard of. Um, so I went into this, just preface, I went into this thinking Julius Caesar was the first Roman emperor. Like, that's not true. I think he's right before the first Roman emperor. Um, he's the first Roman emperor. Do I have it written on here? Um, I think it was like Augustus. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, help me with the first Roman emperor, anyone? No. <laughs> well, don't, I don't judge if you don't judge. But Julius Caesar, Julius, Caesar. <laughs> Julius Caesar was the first one before the first emperor. So in a way, he's kind of like the founder of like the empire, but he wasn't actually an emperor. He was a, a military dude, like a general, I guess, or I don't know, like commander. Um, so he actually had a marriage with Cleopatra, who was an Egyptian princess. And, you know, we've all heard of Cleopatra, but there's actually several Cleopatras. <laughs> like, so Julius Caesar was the one that married Cleopatra Seven. So, you know, there's probably more connections that go through the Greek culture, through the pharaoh, like pharaohs to Greek and then Greek to Roman. But that was a very strong connection, the strongest one I could find between directly between the Roman Empire and the Pharaoh elite bloodline. And, you know, all you really need is one marriage to like, to not necessarily like concrete, like an alliance like that, but to just show that these were like allies that they were working together that, I mean, it is pretty clear when you understand like the way these societies work, that the bloodline is like paramount to them. Like the bloodline is so important that it continues like their bloodline as the, as the elite, as the rulers through history. So, you know, I'm trying to find a proof and there is a proof through Cleopatra and Julius Caesar. It just, you know, it might not seem that significant, but it's there, you know, it's there in the historical record that there's a, a bloodline tie between the Pharaohs and the, the Romans and that, there's probably more than one that's, you know, there's probably a lot of ties between them. It's just, that's, that's the most obvious one that I could locate. I thought Apache had a question. Oh, right. So we, we see like, uh, like you're talking about Cleopatra and Julius Caesar, and we can kind of correlate that with, um, you know, marrying of the bloodlines kind of like, uh, Solomon and Sheba and these different ways to unite the different bloodlines and to uh, kind of unify the kingdoms to kind of create, uh, other kingdoms to tear down uh, certain power structures and, and kind of replace as as the face or the the moving hand of the power structure, if you will. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 
for me, like Marie Antoinette just came to mind, you know, like when, when Austria married into France, it's like, it's just, it kind of consecrates the alliance between the bloodlines. So about the Romans, uh, Jupiter was their main god. Saturn was another very prominent god. And, you know, he had a festival called Saturnalia, which involved orgies and sacrifices. Um, I probably don't need to explain like the extent of human sacrifice that went on in the Roman empire. Like they had gladiator battles, like uh, so much of our culture is actually inspired by and, you know, a modernized version of Roman culture and, you know, definitely like Roman, Roman gladiator, (laughs) sorry. Yeah. Roman gladiator battles are the inspiration for like all of our modern professional sports One interesting note about Julius Caesar is that if you read his Wikipedia, it says that he claimed he came from Venus's bloodline. So, you know, not only did he marry into Cleopatra, but he's claiming he came from Venus's bloodline, which, as you see on the deity chart, that Venus ties back to Lucifer. So Saturnalia turned into a modern day uh, Christmas. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, definitely I mean, not, not the same, um, not the same like ritual practices, but I think the time of the, the holiday and certain things about it probably do tie to Christmas. Bibbidi, you know? Yeah, it was adapted and modified for uh, Christmas uh, after, you know, they basically tried to strip it of the religion it was uh, associated with, and then they tied it to a new yeah, I mean, all those Christian holidays definitely line up date-wise to uh, pagan holidays in the past. Yep, and a lot of the things like hanging stockings and such that are related to uh, Christmas, even leaving cookies and milk, are tied to pagan uh, rituals and stuff. Really, and I think the, the tree try the tree ties to some like druid rituals too, right? Yup, bro, it's it's all sick. Um, the way that they pervert. Um, you know, it's, this is one thing, it's kind of always piqued my mind when we know that certain things like Israel was created, you know, um, the Vatican was created. Um, you know, I wonder if even the Bible uh, was tainted with that kind of thing. If it was, you know, we know that it's been considered a uh, control of the masses, but if it was actually just kind of originated as that, if that was the intent initially, and it was, you know, created by maybe like it was a, um, more original and successful watchtower, right? Where it was created by a bloodline and it is basically brainwashed people that are um, all kept in line. I think to an extent it is, but like the thing to understand is that, one second, I got to let go of my button because <laughs> I'm like typing on my thing, one second. But yeah, like the thing to understand is that they mix like the truthful good sections of these scriptures with um, sections that aren't so good that like they add in. Um, so, you know, there, there's stuff that appeals to people that's definitely like true and like, you know, good to believe in, but then there's also these control mechanisms thrown in, like, especially, you know, like submissiveness to like the Pope figure and, um, totalitarianism and, you know, what they did with it in like the inquisition is just like horrifying. Um, but so like they, they kind of like lure you in with like some good ideas, but then like attach it to these like really negative practices. So yeah, definitely. And I think we are at, um, so we're at this period between like the Roman empire and Judea when monotheism is created. I mean, it's already created, it's created when they established Judea, if not before that. When they, when they return the Torah to Judea at the start of the Second Temple period. And at the same time, you have the Romans who are polytheistic. You know, they have Jupiter, Saturn, and all their gods um, trying to find a monotheistic religion because monotheism works really well for absolute monarchies. And so once they become an empire, they, they, you know, they're trying to keep their empire together. And they see that monotheism is a good way to keep all the people happy to have it like not be different cults fighting with each other so something that i learned doing this that i never really knew was that rome actually tried three different attempts to do monotheistic religion before the christianity stuck and um one of the ones just prior to christianity was sol invictus which was another form of sun worship that was almost 
I don't want to say identical to Atonism because I haven't really studied either of them well enough to know, but, you know, Atonism was the worship of the sun disk and then Sol Invictus was the worship of like Sol, which is the sun and kind of personifying the sun. Another thing to note that is not as prominent of a point on, on the Cult of Bell map as it is on the Sephiroth map, but, or the original Sephiroth map, uh, this, this religion called Mithraism is an important a religion in Rome to understand because let me say it again Mithraism <laughs> well first of all you see just in the word is the myth of Ra so that's tying it back to Egyptian religions but Mithraism was actually a Persian origin religion and a lot of the practice of it involved bull slaughter so when you see um, like if you look up Mithraism on Wikipedia the picture you'll see is of a, a statue of a human slaughtering a bull like slitting a bull's throat and this was a religion that was popular among the Roman army, which obviously is a very important part of the Roman Empire. There you go. You got the bull. So it's just showing you again, like, I don't even know if I've mentioned necessarily that the Baal is like the bull head with like a human body that takes like blood sacrifice. But, you know, this is showing that like the Roman soldiers were into this religion that is clearly a modified version of Baalism because, you know, they're, they're spilling like um, bull blood as like the main ritual of the religion. There you go. There's Baal. I mean, the Baal worship, which was like really his, historians have really placed the Baal worship that's associated with child sacrifice with the Phoenicians. So they were saying that like Carthage, which was the Phoenician capital established around 800 BC, was kind of the center of this Baal religion that practiced human sacrifice openly, that practiced child sacrifice openly. It was like an open part of their culture that, you know, if they were having um, a drought or if they were about to be invaded, like they could sacrifice their children to Baal and hopefully change their fortune. But so like the thesis of this is that the Baal worship kind of was similar to the set worship of the Hyksos and then it's similar to the Mithraism of the Romans and the, sat, sat, the cult of Saturn of the Romans. And then, you know, that, that same philosophy is part of the Vatican at its core. Now, not, something to note here is that the, the Romans were at war with that Jude, Judea Second Temple period. <laughs> Let me just say, I think I said this before we started, but Judea refers to... I think at times it was a kingdom in that region, the, the Israel region, I'm saying. Uh, you know, now we call it Israel, so it's so easy. We think Israel, we know exactly what it is. So it's tempting to just say Israel, but, you know, this is like a shifting kingdom. Like, And I think under, like, after Cyrus freed them, they were sort of like a feudal to the, the, the Babylonians, but then the Romans came and conquered throughout the the Babylonians, and then they were sort of in charge of Judea, but they gave Judea some autonomy as well. Um, this king, uh, Herod the Great, Roman appointed king of the Judea, um, was at 40 BC. This is on the this is on the Sephir, or on the Cult of Bell map. So it's like they had their own king, but they were sort of like feudal to the Romans, and then you know there was constant um, like rebellion going on, and that's what you call the Judean Wars which there's a big, long Roman book about the Judean Wars written by Josephus Flavius. And, you know, I don't want to sound too smart like I read it or anything, but <laughs> in that book is where it actually puts out the theory or the thesis that the Hebrews were the Egyptian Hyksos. So, I mean, aside from these modern books that have been written about trying to figure out who the Hebrews really were, you have Josephus Flavius of Flavius of the Romans um, writing the book Judean Wars and writing that the Hebrews were actually these Hyksos dynasty pharaohs. So the Romans, like I'm saying, like the Romans and the, the, the Judea are constantly at, or not constantly, but there's like revolts going on, there's wars going on. And eventually the Roman emperor Titus invades Judea and destroys the second temple. And at that point, you have like a near, as from what I read about, it's like the near total genocide within that region or within like the core of Judea. Like he really like exterminates. That is 70 AD, or um, 
That is tiny text. <laughs> Where's the second temple? Uh, Emperor Titus, second temple. Oh, God, it's so small on my paper. It's like practically invisible. Yeah, I was right, 70 AD. See, I have this stuff memorized <laughs> because I've written all of it. It's 70 AD, it's t um, Emperor Titus destroyed. There you go. I was just going to say, pull up that image. So yeah, on the, the Arch of Titus in Rome, you have this uh, relief engraving of the, the Roman soldiers bringing home the loot from Jerusalem. Um, and it's just, you know, when I saw this, I was kind of shocked because, you know, we think of Rome in such a positive light, I feel like, you know, and nowadays we're like, you know, always comparing ourselves to Rome and, you know, all those all roads lead to Rome. But you have, you know, this kind of like, it's not a race history, but it's definitely not taught that the Romans completely like obliterated the Jewish culture like 70 years after Christ supposedly lived. Um, so it's just interesting that, you know, those are the same people who then decided, I guess it would be about 200 years later or so, maybe 300 years to adopt this religion. So it's just a really a complete reversal of going from like exterminating these people to adopting, you know, the Old Testament to be the, the first book of the Bible. And so it's kind of like a mind fuck. Like how did this culture go from, you know, trying to exterminate them to taking their religion as like the state religion. And, um, you know, it's, it's more of a complicated proof than I can explain right now, <laughs> but it's just, it's, I think like the key to it is that, they're satanic. <laughs> no, I don't know. Let me just go back to the left side and maybe we'll get there. How are we on time? I, I, have been, I feel like I've been talking for like hours. You're doing great, bro. I think we can accelerate a little bit. Like we really have gotten through like the complicated part. I'm just, I think, and a lot of people like kind of know this history going forward, you know, like the, the early part was a really confusing part. And then going forward, I feel like people know like a little bit more and the connections might be easier to explain. Does that make sense? Definitely. And then we'll still get a little bit of time for the question. For sure. Um, so yeah, so Rome establishes the Vatican. Constantine was the emperor at the time of like that council of Nicaea, which I think was the first council that decided that Christianity would be the state religion. And also that council decided which books were in the Bible, which books were out of the Bible. So like the book of Enoch was out of the Bible. And then like the Torah was in the Bible is what was decided then. And they also were the ones who decided that Jesus was the son of God, like during that council. Um, you know, Jesus had followers before, which were the Gnostics, which I think he had multiple like sects of followers, but like the Gnostics were one of the main ones. And they believed that the world was ruled by archons and that you would find redemption through Gnosis, which is gaining wisdom. Um, they had a whole different set of gods that are really crazy looking if you want to look them up. Uh, a few of them are listed here, Abraxas and Yaldabaoth. Now I think Yaldabaoth was kind of analogous to Satan. Um, they considered Yaldabaoth to be like Lord Archon. And it was basically like a negative entity who was ruling over earth. And I think they, they felt that Jesus had come and like helped them, you know, helped guide them with like his teachings. But they definitely didn't believe that the Hebrew God was, you know, the good guy in the situation. Like they thought that the world was ruled by evil entities and that, you know, they follow Jesus to try to find knowledge and conquer these evil entities. Oh, nice archon you posted there. <laughs> um, so yeah, the Gnostics considered who we, who we think of as God or who his original name in, in the Hebrew was Yahweh. They considered him to be Lord Archon and like the evil one. And they didn't consider, like they didn't believe there was a good one that like opposed him. Like they thought, you know, the only way to find redemption was to learn things for yourself through Gnosis. So yeah, a lot of people have a hard time like wrapping their mind around, like we're so built into like the God and Satan construct that people really, I mean, they don't want to accept that there might not be a good one, that there might just be like on this chart, like Lucifer and Satan. But then 
there's different ways to understand like what a good God is. Cause like if the good God is say like within or maybe like a universal consciousness or like what a lot of like, you know, new age or what people like, you know, 5d would call like source. Um, you know, that's, we consider to be another name for God, like the way that most Christians think of God. Um, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know what I'm saying? Yep. Shout out to 5D. Matt Maker made one uh, Grand Solar Flash. Boom. Yeah. He's definitely into this whole like source concept as God. And so am I actually. I think a lot of people are starting to see God as more of like a universal collective consciousness source as opposed to like a personification necessarily or like a but then I mean there's also like these new agers believe in like archangels and um like communication with like specific like energies like Christ consciousness so there's a lot of different ways to look at this but um, yeah like so like the gnostics looked at it as like the hebrew god was kind of the, the bad one um but then the vatican came along and said that that Hebrew God was the good one or that, that that was the Jesus's father. And so that's how it was from then on. And most people don't know at all that there was even any other ideas about Jesus or any other religions based on Jesus other than what's taught in basic Christianity, which is all derived from the Vatican version. Um, you know, I think I said early on that the Protestants basically just threw out the Pope and like modified Catholicism a little bit whereas the original Christians had a bunch of like very different ideas um, about Jesus and about, you know, well, I, w I wouldn't even be Christianity back then, but followers of Jesus had different ideas other than what became the codified Bible version of Christianity. So from here, I think we can jump like kind of fast, like through these things. <laughs> I think even I'm getting a little bit tired. I mean, it hasn't been almost two hours. Like an hour and a half. All right. Well, it gets pretty simple, okay? So the um, Rome eventually loses Judea to the Persian Empire, okay? Or at that point, they become Muslim by then. So Islam's created 632 AD. There's theories that the Vatican actually created Islam, like for a reason of maybe controlling this region, like maybe kind of doing like a controlled burn of some of these other religions, because so they created like the most extreme form of intolerant religion that they could um, to get rid of the people that oppose them. So that's one theory. Like there's a whistleblower named um, Alberto Riviera who claims that he's like a defected Jesuit that has insider knowledge that the Vatican did create Islam as a weapon of ethnic cleansing. Um, but any, either way, like it kind of got out of control, either it got out of control or this was the intent to have like perpetual war in the region, which is still going on today. Um, but so Islam takes over Israel. Um, the Vatican then eventually does the crusades to take back the israel region the holy land um so that's why the knights templar are created as the soldiers to retake the holy land for the vatican i don't know if i should i guess i'll try to really briefly mention every point on this main chart because they are kind of interesting and important um but the praetorian guard which connects the roman empire to the templars what that is signifying is the praetorian guard was an elite an elite force within the army that was specifically to protect the the Roman Empire, the Roman Emperor. Um, and what eventually happened with the Praetorian Guard was that they took on too much power, and sort of like exactly like what happened with JFK, the Praetorian Guard started becoming responsible for assassinating the emperors, and it declined from like an empire into like a military dictatorship, um, with the Praetorian Guard actually choosing the next emperors. You know, I, I guess that kind of like would interfere with the idea of like a bloodline being continuous, but <laughs> somehow, I well, maybe like the, at the height of the bloodline, that's what they want is a military dictatorship. So that's what happened with the Praetorian Guard. It's just like the, the elite force that takes over and starts dictating like the policy, becoming a military dictatorship. And so it's, the, the Templars never did the same thing to the Vatican, but you'll see later on the Jesuits kind of become a similar force to the Praetorian Guard. And then the CIA sort of becomes a similar force to the Jesuits later on. 
So it's sort of this pattern that's repeating throughout history. That's why that's an important point to understand. Okay, so we're down to the Knights Templar. We got to get to the Khazars on the right. Okay, so the Khazars were a kingdom that was between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea in like southeastern Asia, or sorry, southwestern Asia. And through that region was a lot of Jewish refugees fleeing like the persecution of the Romans. And they, they had established Jewish trade routes all over the entire world, um, which were, these were Jewish people called the Radonites. So you can look up like Radonite trade routes. And actually I can drop it in here. Um, but the Radonites had trade routes that spanned all over like the entire like ancient world. And so they were, um, that region of Khazaria was very important to the Silk Road because it was central between Europe and Asia. And so they were sort of like the arbiters of this like global trade and the Radonites had already established their routes all over. And so they had a very strong influence in Khazaria. And so the original kingdom of Khazaria was the, the basically kind of descendants of like Attila the Hun. Like they had been sort of like organized by Attila the Hun originally. But then they sort of broke off into their own little kingdom. So those peoples originally practiced, basically, it was called Tengrism, which is a sky religion of a sky god. And there's obvious parallels between that and Baal worship, because Baal was like the storm god, the sky god. I mean, basically, between the two main archetypes, like the Satan archetype and the Lucifer archetype, Satan is always more like representing the sky god the the storm god the sky god whereas venus lucifer um isis is usually more like representing the earth earth god um also like moon uh yeah so their god the god of the khazars was tengrism shamanic sky god um, so they were in a way practicing like a form of Baalism and they were known as being like very like brutal. I mean, this is like the Hun, like they call them like the horde. Um, I mean, they refined into a more of like a developed culture, but they would definitely have been considered like pagans and maybe even like kind of like extreme pagans. So especially like their neighbors, like everything that had been written about them was just, um, talking about like how savage they were and like how like no one could pass through Kazaria because like, they would like immediately be like robbed and have their identity stolen. <laughs> so there's a few like very negative um, adjectives about the Khazars below that title, but a lot of this is how they were known like before they even converted to Judaism. Um, but it's just important to understand that they were kind of these like somewhat civilized, but somewhat barbaric uh, culture in that region that derived from Asians, but um, was also heavily infiltrated and um, controlled by these Jewish Radonite merchants. So eventually due to um, pressures from their neighboring regions, I think they had, they had the, the Muslims to the South and like the Christians also to the South, but also to the West. Um, they were influenced to convert to one of these Abrahamic religions and they decided the Kings, um, Bulan and Obadiah, I think. <laughs> Bulan and Obadiah, they decided to convert the kingdom to Judaism to sort of be like an in-between between like the Christians and the Muslims. Um, it's actually a decision that is pretty hard to understand in a historical context because the, the Jewish people were kind of universally persecuted. So it's like, why would this independent kingdom want to, you know, convert to Judaism? But Nonetheless, they did. I think, I think there was strong influence of these Radonites, like we're really controlling the region. And so they converted to Judaism. Um, that's how the Radonites connect to them. I think that they, they influenced that conversion. Um, eventually, that kingdom just fell apart. I think they were invaded by people from the north and from the south, and they were driven out. And so this is where it gets into a point where there's a little bit of contention between what say like conspiracy theory researchers and mainstream historians say what happened. Um, so I think mainstream historians pretty much say that the Khazars just dissolved and kind of like went nowhere. Just the whole culture sort of like disappeared. 
Um, but then this dude, Arthur Russell, who wrote the book, The 13th Tribe, um, which is kind of the most, I think, well-known book that's about the Khazars and their history. And like from like a truthful, um, you know, not anti-Semitic standpoint, but from like a truthful, like really trying to figure out history standpoint and not just like, you know, paint the Jewish people as like in a Jewish, in a, in a good light, which is not really painting them in a bad light. But, um, you know, his theory is that a lot of these Khazars then migrated to Europe and formed the basis for the Jewish communities in Germany and Spain. Um, which is, you know, I think it's probably a little bit of combination of both. You know, I think some Khazars definitely probably immigrated to Europe and, and joined um, Jewish communities there. And then also, obviously, like Jewish people that came out of Judea, you know, while the Romans were like persecuting, like created refugees and they went to other regions as well. So, you know, I think that the Jewish population in Europe is probably a mix of these Khazars and um, the original people from Judea. And I mean, it's not like one of them was the synagogue of Satan, one of them wasn't, but because <laughs> I think the, um, you know, the synagogue of Satan, which is that t- the caption on the Judea thing, you know, that term comes from the Bible and the Bible says that there's this section of the Jews that's the synagogue of Satan. It's not clear if the Bible is saying all the Jews or some of them, or, you know, it's the ones that wouldn't accept Jesus. So it's, it's, I think that that synagogue of Satan, um, is primarily associated with this group. It's like a, a sect of the Jews, that, which was called the Pharisees, which was kind of like the elite sect. So again, it's like, it's not saying all of them, but it's like the elites of them, which is um, concentrated in this sect called the Pharisees. And it's also interesting to note that phonomically, Pharisees and Pharaohs, um, that's just something I noticed that, you know, the two T- names like why is the name of this Jewish sect like so it sounds so similar phonomically to the pharaohs the Pharisees it's like hmm why would you want to be named after your slave owner so let's see I, I sort of went back there a little bit because I forgot to describe that caption before um well, so let's just jump back to the right um so I have Baphomet on the Templars the Templars they let's see when oh friday the 13th 1307 so <laughs> friday the 13th 1307 is when the french king decided or i'm not sure if you know wait i think that's yeah that's when the french king issued a decree to basically arrest all the templars and they were accused of worshiping baphomet and um homosexuality which was like a really big problem in that day or a really big sin i guess um and he started like burning all of them on stakes and basically Templars were outlawed at that point. So, you know, Templars had their day between like um, 1119 and 1307. And then they pretty much get uh, wiped off the face of the earth, <laughs> like publicly wiped off the face of the earth. So there's a lot of theories about like what actually happened to the Templars. Like you guys might've heard um, so I think some of them did, you know, they escaped Europe from this persecution by the, the French king. And then the Vatican jumped on board at that point, too. They, they kind of went underground, you know, some of them became pirates, some of them, some of them got burned on the stake, some of them <laughs> had gone to the New World, even who knows. But before that happened, the Templars established a country like when when their last when their last um, fortress in the Holy Land fell, which was Acre, that's what you see um, to the left of Switzerland. You have a little illustration that says Holy Land, fall of Acre. That's when the Templars left the Holy Land for the last time. And it was only actually two months later that Switzerland like had its charter, its original charter signed. And so like that's the thesis that comes from that Chats of Frats, the Pharaoh show video is that the Pharaohs, or sorry, the, the Templars were the original ones who established Switzerland. So there's evidence of that and that they had established the banking system near the Templars, medieval banking, yeah. The connection between the Templars and Switzerland is says pontifical guard, which um, I'm not sure if you guys 
have heard or have seen the images of, if you could pull up an image of pontifical guard, that'd be great. But basically Swiss soldiers guard the Vatican. And so there's clearly this connection between the Vatican and Switzerland. Like why do Swiss soldiers guard the Vatican like still in 2018? Well, it's because <laughs> Switzerland was founded by the Templars. And so the Swiss were kind of like the original like OG, like the home base of the Templars. And so like while the Knights Templar may have been persecuted by the French king and then subsequently the Vatican like jumped on board, you know, they still have their home base in Switzerland and you still have like the Swiss guards defending the Vatican. So it's clearly this like really strong alliance between the Vatican and Switzerland that has existed ever since the founding of Switzerland. And, you know, that you see, especially like, I think in World War II, like the alliance between the Vatican and, and um, Switzerland, how they're both sort of like exempt from the war and they're both kind of like helping each other out in different ways. Um, okay. So let's see, where are we? Let's, let's get, let's get, this is kind of like what happened to the Khazars. So I've kind of explained how the Khazars, their country fell and they most likely immigrated to Europe. So they will be immigrating to Europe as Jews and in the middle ages in Europe. So we have um, court Jews connecting the Khazars to Switzerland. Now this isn't like a direct connection between the Khazars and Switzerland, but if these are some like rich Jews coming to Europe, what happened to the rich Jews in Europe is that they were made into court Jews or another word for that is a court factor. And that is a member of like a Royal court who would handle the money of the King or of the Royal family. And this was done as a, a liability to the Royal family that, you know, if something went wrong, sometimes that court factor would be responsible instead of the Royal. And I think there was even, um, some court factors who may have even been executed as a result of the royal dying who owed money to people and then the court factor would be held responsible. So this wasn't like a very desirous position. It was, it was a position um, it, as a tool of the royal family. It's just crazy to me that, <laughs> I mean, I thought that was history. I had never knew that there was something even called a court Jew or a court factor and part of the reason they used Jews in that role was because um, Jews were exempt from usury. Like I think Christians were not allowed to maybe charge interest and then the Jews were according to their religion. So that's why they would use them in this position. So they, they you know, they'd be committing usury, but like through an, an agent basically. And then the other thing coming out of Khazars is Converosos. And Converosos is... Um, Jews in the Middle Ages who were forced to convert to Christianity. Some of them through the Inquisition, like that was a big part of the Inquisition, especially in Spain, was forcing the Jews to convert to Christianity. Like there was a lot of hostility toward Jews in Europe during this whole period. In Europe, there was a lot of hostility toward Jews during that period. So yeah, the Inquisition involved forcing a lot of Jews to convert to um, Christianity. And a lot of them, um, once they converted, still practiced Judaism secretly, um, which were called crypto Jews, was um, Jews that were forced to convert to Catholicism that still secretly practiced Judaism like in their home, but then in the public life, they would um, present themselves as Christians. So that takes us down to the Jesuits bubble. Um, let me make sure that we've covered enough in the other areas. So. Um, in the middle of that little triangle, you see the fall of Atil. Now, that, that's just the capital of Khazaria. So that would be the, the Khazar exodus, we call it, um, the Khazars, the, the country dissolving and the people of that country either migrating to Europe or who knows where they went. Like the theory from uh, the, the person who wrote the 13th tribe book is that most of them migrated to Europe. And, you know, became the, the elites became these court Jews and Conferosos in, in high positions of power. And um, so, so we're at the Inquisition. And the, the thing to understand about the Inquisition is that it started in Switzerland. Um, the first part of the Inquisition, or the, the Inquisition started with this thing called the Valais Witch Trial. And so Valais is a city in Switzerland. And 
they had the first like witch trial that that was sort of the um archetype for i guess the the rest of the inquisition and it was around that time that this this book the hammer of the witches which which has another name i think it's like malefactus malefactorum or something in a different language but that's 1487 so this was a book written in actually when i just researched it before we started this it's actually written in germany but you know at this point the elites across europe are all interconnected and this book basically spelled out the the like the legal the legal procedure for identifying and burning with people who were accused of being witches um and so it's just you know it's a really sick document and it's really sick that this um this document became like the justification for like witch burnings across all of europe for mm, how long did the inquisition go on for well it started with that valet's witch trial 1487 and um definitely went through like the protestant reformation probably the creation of the jesuits so you know you had almost 100 years of like burning witches most likely um <laughs> some sick times um, so that at the same time, you have the the um, this, the power structure starts expanding and becoming, you know, more decentralized rapidly in this period of like the Middle Ages, and these the, so these points jump around a lot. They don't exactly connect like directly, but so there's a lot of points jumping in between. We have Venetians coming out of Switzerland, and we have black nobility at the top of the Switzerland node. And I think most of you guys probably know what black nobility is, but that's just the nobility of Europe. You know, the, the ruling, the people ruling Europe, black nobility, the name that black nobility came originally from Venetians because the nobility in Venice would wear all black. And so they became known as black nobility. And then <laughs> Venice was just an important city for a number of reasons. Um, in that city was developed like a lot of these sort of Masonic traditions that um, carried through all the way to the Freemasons and to the occultists today. The Venice was a trade and luxury capital. So in a way that uh, the elites sort of got their grasp on the economy through Venice because it became like the center for trade and luxury goods. And while at the same time they were taking the, their grasp on the financial world, like originally from the Templars. And then I think in the very beginning of this, we went through um, the moving of the banking capital, which went from Florence, Italy, to Hamburg, Germany, to Amsterdam, and then finally to London. Um, so a really important point, or like important, four important points that that really lead to the development of like the modern world are here in this little quadrants like right below switzerland so you have it's a little bit tough to follow the chronology of these because they're sort of all like thrown in there but you have the dutch east india company um the bank of england united kingdom and then freemasonry and it's in that order um and then actually the rothschilds come after freemasonry but so that's the chronology is like dutch east india 1602 um so just to explain that a little bit the Jesuits were formed as a response to the Protestant Reformation, which was a response to the Inquisition. So, you know, you have the Catholic Church burning everyone across Europe. And like, you know, the, the regular everyday people are getting a little bit sick of this. And, you know, they want to leave the Catholic Church, but they don't want to leave their religion. So that's why Protestantism is formed. And it's called the Protestant Reformation. And then the Jesuits are formed by the Vatican Church as a response to the Protestant Reformation. And so when most people think of Jesuits, they think of the Jesuits as educators. And, you know, we think there's Jesuit schools, there's Jesuits colleges. Um, they think of Jesuits as the main, like, missionaries of the Vatican. And that's definitely all true. But then what they don't know is that the Jesuits also have a very powerful role in controlling trade and in controlling the economy and also as sort of like a secret service, like a CIA type organization. Like they, they're responsible for assassinations the Vatican wants to carry out, at least back in those days. <laughs> and I'm sure today. So. Aren't they also the black Pope and 
the Pope that's truly in power that is basically commanding over the white Pope, which we more com- commonly know as the white Pope. Exactly. Now, we'll, um, since their origin, I wouldn't say that they're in charge of the, they're over the, the Vatican at that point. The point when they become over the Vatican is further down on this chart, which is, um, I guess, well, be the end of the Napoleonic Wars was when they used Napoleon to take over the Vatican and forcibly um, put themselves above the white Pope. So I think at that point is when they would have gone above the white Pope. But, you know, they've always had a Jesuit superior general, and it's been an intense relationship between the Jesuits and the Vatican, um, especially in this early period. Like I think nowadays, like I said, after the Napoleonic Wars, the Jesuits rule. Thank you for the meme. But before that, the Jesuits were struggling to take over the Vatican. Um, you know, this brings me back to um, a line in this in the original essay about the Sephirot map, which says, you know, all these elite secret societies are interlinked as shown on this map, even though they may at times throughout history have been at odds and even at war with one another. It's been a cutthroat power struggle fought tooth and nail between these groups. Cannibals seem to have a propensity for cannibalizing each other along with their innocent victims. Yet somehow, despite their malicious infighting, they managed to be significantly more organized and far more deadly than the general peace-loving population. So you see that really strongly with the relationship between the Jesuits and the Vatican. Um, They're created as, you know, a a division to help the Vatican, but then they eventually gain too much power. And um, so there's several books about the Jesuits that explain that the Jesuits were responsible for assassinating not just one Pope or two, but like several Popes. Like, you know, like you can count them, you can count them on like two hands, the number of Popes that the Jesuits have actually assassinated throughout history. Yep. yep. And, and, you know, uh, big, something I think everybody all, should, oh, sorry, go ahead. If, if anybody wants to uh, know a little bit more about Jesuits, I think the first thing you should look up is their, uh, uh their oath that they take, and it is a really disgusting oath. Yes, for sure. And there are several books about them. Um, if you just, I'm not sure exactly what to tell you to search for, because you'll probably find some, some nice books about them too, but there are several books about them as like conspiratorial organization. Do I have the Jesuit oath on here? That's important. I might need to add that bullet point, Redank. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, that's definitely like read that Jesuit oath. That's actually on the Q web. So if you don't see it on here, that that should be on here. Um, But so, yeah, eventually. So to go through this next section, we definitely need to talk about the Jesuits first, because eventually. Oh, actually, so I don't want to get ahead. I'm getting a little bit ahead. Let me just say that so the jesuits were responsible as the missionaries for the vatican and so they were all over the world as like the missionaries like spreading the religion to you know japan to asia to is i guess america probably even yeah america exists at that point not the country america but you know the colonies and you know um mexico uh, central america so jesuits are go all over spreading the vatican's message and so consequently the jesuits are the ones in the best position to facilitate global trade. And the Dutch East India Company is the first, what you would consider uh, a transnational corporation. And the reason they had so much success with that Dutch East India country is because they were in an alliance with the Jesuits. And now this is a little bit confusing because the Dutch at that time was a Protestant country. And so it's like, why are the Jesuits making an alliance with the Dutch East India. And I'm, I'm not really sure what the answer is to that, other than that these people are just complete hypocrites. <laughs> and, you know, they'll, they'll earn a buck, like, over following true to, like, any religion any day, because, you know, their religion is the Satanism, which is, like, self-serving. And, you know, they really don't give a crap about um, you know, following any of these rules that they claim to set for themselves. Like their only rule is to enrich themselves and to um, gain as much power for themselves as they can. And so I think the Jesuits probably saw like an alliance with the Protestant of the Dutch as a way for them to actually get more power than the Vatican eventually. And eventually they did. But before that happened, let's see. 
what's the order here? So Jesuits, I'm looking for the Jesuit suppression. That's 1769. Okay, so then, okay, so before that, before all that happened, the Dutch East India Company becomes like the biggest, most powerful company in the world. Um, we go into this period called the Dutch Golden Age, which is when the Netherlands, which is the Dutch people, was basically supremacy of world supremacy in trade, science, military, and art. So through the Jesuits, the Dutch are becoming enriched. Oh, there's a nice book about the Jesuits. <laughs> and the Dutch, you know, becomes the most powerful country in the world. And in 1688, Prince William III, who's a Dutch prince, invades England and successfully conquers England. So in 1688, this is called the Glorious Revolution, England is taken over by the Netherlands. And so this is a part of history that is completely official history, but nobody like acknowledges it or really like talks about it, especially not English people. It's like, you know, the, the, the monarchy of England was completely taken over. It was a bloodless revolution. Nobody died. He just showed up with like the best fleet of ships in the world and um, a really powerful army. And England was in a, in a weakened state and they just had no means to even defend themselves. So the Dutch took over England in 1688 and it's part of history that nobody really knows. Um, and that's one of the things that I discovered in making this that I was like, what? Like, and it's funny, like you can read articles about this in like mainstream sources, but they'll say, um, they'll just be like, yeah, like not many people acknowledge this, but it happened. <laughs> and so then what you see after that is like England, like falling into this um, power structure that had been developing and um, they had been, you know, moving their banking capital around. This is where you see the banking capital move from Amsterdam to London is after this invasion. And the reason why is because they took over. So, so shortly after this invasion, you know, from 1688, to 1694 is when they established the Bank of England. So it was very clearly like this Dutch force invaded and then they established their banking system in England, which is now like one of the, you know, the most important global banks in the world today. And, you know, not only they established the bank, but then in 1707, they established the actual country, United Kingdom. So, you know, there's a little bit of a delay in between that invasion and establishing the new name for the country, but the United Kingdom is clearly a result of the, the Dutch invasion, which was the Glorious Revolution of 1688. And then, just 10 years after that, you have the foundation of the first United Grand Masonic Lodge, which is the United Grand Lodge of England uh, in London. And so this is when Masons really become a how we think of them today. Freemasonry becomes what we think of it today. Before that, Freemasons were responsible for building cathedrals. It was like a guild of craftsmen, basically. And once they established that Grand Lodge in England, it goes from like craftsmen to like creepy elites, like doing rituals in private. <laughs> I mean, I think it was a more gradual transition than that, but that's really the, um, the point when it becomes, you know, identifiably what it is today. And free, within Freemasonry, they claim to be the descendants of the Templars. So theoretically, you know, some of these Templars who didn't get burned on the stakes went underground into hiding and then came back as the Masons when, when the Freemasons became a thing um, after 1717, or maybe even before that, they were part of the lodges. Um, but like within Freemasonry, there are... Um, how would you say there are divisions or uh, there are sects of Freemasonry, which, which call themselves the Templar and um, within the Freemasonry, like thought they consider themselves to be the heirs of the Templar. Like they're considered to be like, you know, like their great, great, great grandfather was a Templar or whatever. So that's the connection between those two. That's a very direct connection between Knights Templar and Masons. Because if you go into lodges, I mean, I went into the um washington's masonic memorial outside of washington dc and on the top floor is what they call the templar chapel <laughs> and so i mean any confusion in my mind at that point about 
if there's a connection between the Templars and the Masons was pretty much like confirmed because, you know, within Washington's memorial, there's an actual Templar chapel, which has a standing mannequin of like a Templar in full armor. So, you know, it could have been more obvious. And you know, they, they kind of brag about it. You know, like that's like their heritage is like being from, from Templars. So then you have Masonry has been established at that point. Um, Scottish Rite is basically the branch of masonry that was, I think, infiltrated by the Jesuits most directly. Um, it's like the most directly controlled like Jesuit branch of Freemasonry. It's a little bit sketchy there. I, well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's confirmed. So we have Rothschild dynasty, which is a, a very important point in terms of what becomes the global banking system, because, you know, we all know, I think, <laughs> who have been following QAnon, like how much we talk about like the Rothschild banks and um, that like, you know, they're like controlling everything. But the important point to note, like for me, at least when I learned about that thing called court factors or court Jews, I was like, well, that's so obviously like exactly what the Rothschild bank is because, you know, it's like once again, like using a Jewish family to be sort of like the face of this banking structure when really it, it, behind the scenes is controlled by either the Vatican or the Jesuits. So that's why I think the Rothschild family was given the power it has. Like, I don't think it was like through their own ingenuity or th through their own family connections. I mean, the, the father of the first Rothschild who was a banker, like was not like anyone important. I mean, I think he, he was in the business of trading like gold coins, which was what they did back in those days. But he, um, you know, he, he was given access to these royal bank accounts. Like, you know, they granted him like this title as court factor. Um, and that's how the family became so rich and powerful. Like they completely became powerful as a result of being given permission by the royalty to become rich and powerful. Now it gets a little bit more unclear, like further later on when, you know, we have the Rothschilds giving the Vatican loans. So, you know, in some ways it would appear that, you know, they're, 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 what do you call them, like landlord or whatever. Like if you give someone a loan, like you're there, you have control over them. But I think that even, even when you see the Rothschilds giving the Vatican loans, it's like, it's basically like the Vatican giving itself a loan, you know? Because I think since the beginning that the, the Rothschild dynasty has been controlled by the Jesuits and the Vatican. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, the first uh, Rothschild was actually born poor in the ghetto and was able to rise to his wealth through his job, his profession as a banker. Yep. Yep. So, so during this time, there, like, I guess you know, we're talking seventeen hundreds. Um, it's actually in seventeen seventy three that, that the Jesuit suppression happens, which is the Pope declaring the Jesuits as like illegal outlaws, um, you know, banishing the Jesuits, um, just dissociating the Vatican from the Jesuits. And this was kind of an agreement between both the Vatican and the European monarchies, because the Jesuits had been interfering so much in both the monarchies and the Vatican, you know, doing assassinations, like putting who they want in charge. Um, definitely like several popes had been assassinated. And actually, um, the Jesuits had just assassinated one pope, Let's see, Pope Clement the the thirteenth assassinated. They thought they had the next pope like under their finger. They thought the next pope was going to be like everything's all cool, but the next pope actually like turned on them and like got in alliance with like the monarchies and suppressed the Jesuits. So then we see this huge internal power structure going on throughout Europe um, of the Jesuits basically trying to regain their control that they had and. The first thing they do after suppression in 1773 is form the Illuminati in 1776. And so, you know, you can definitely read about the Illuminati on Wikipedia that uh, this Jesuit professor of canon law, former Jesuit professor of canon law, Adam Weishaupt, is the one who founded the Illuminati. And then immediately the Illuminati go about setting forth to infiltrate the Freemasons in both America and in Europe. And the Jesuits go about fomenting what, what becomes the Napo Napoleonic Wars. Um, so actually, first, 
you know, it's suggested in these in these books that research the Jesuits that the Jesuits sort of fomented the French Revolution. Like I've heard, um, you guys have maybe heard these stories about the 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 propaganda flyers about Marie Antoinette that said like, "Let them eat cake." Have you heard about those? <laughs> I'll, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> Are we recording? Yes, I've heard of them. Sorry, I haven't. Ah, uh, well, if, if you've seen the movie Marie Antoinette, um, there's definitely, you know, they, they show that there's like part of the reason that the people turned against the French monarchy was because there was these like propaganda flyers saying that like Marie Antoinette was just like eating cake while everyone in the country was starving. And so it's suggested in these books about the Jesuits that the Jesuits were actually putting out this propaganda and like fermenting this French revolution. Um, so the French revolution happened. And then shortly thereafter, the Napoleonic Wars happened where like this French king, or I guess, yeah, you call him a king, um, took over basically all of Europe. And, you know, what I learned doing this map is that Napoleon went as far as to take over the Vatican and at that point, the Pope was imprisoned by Napoleon. And while he was in prison, he was forced to reinstate the Jesuits. And that's how the Jesuits came back into power. And that's also how the Jesuits became in a position above the Vatican. Like you were saying before, Dank, like that, you know, the Black Pope is above the White Pope. Well, that's how it is now, like since the, since the Napoleonic Wars, when Napoleon took the Pope hostage and forced him into this position. Boom. Boom. Yeah. I was like, whoa. Like, I never knew that. I didn't know that Napoleonic Wars ended with, like, the, the Pope being imprisoned and, like, forced to give the Jesuits their power back. But so then, at this point, Europe becomes really, like, cohesively controlled by this power structure. And, you know, there's, you know, I wouldn't say peace in Europe because then you get into the world wars, but Europe becomes... Um, a little more united in like a mission to take back America. And that's what's called the Holy Alliance. The Holy Alliance of 1822 is um, part of these treaties that ended the Napoleonic Wars. There was like the, I think it's called the Congress of Verona, in which the Jesuits allied with the European monarchies with the mission to take back America, like within this power structure. And so... So at this point, the, the map sort of jumps into a more like concrete timeline on that lower left. After you have like that Holy Alliance happen, like there's a little infiltration of USA left side of page. So then you jump over to like below like L'Enfant Plan and you see like infiltration of USA. And then it goes through like, so like this is when like, the events are very firmly established. Um, I actually got a lot of this timeline from that Pepe meme. Let me see if I can drop it in for you because it was a really good way to show this timeline. Yeah, here it is. Ready? Sorry, wait, I dropped it in the wrong program. One second. There it is. So actually, I had already been following most of this timeline in my own research, but when I saw this meme, I was like, oh my God, it's like, the exact timeline I was doing, except with even more bullet points in there. So it shows you how after, after that Holy Alliance in 1822, America starts having like even more problems. <laughs> I mean, they had already had the War of 1812 was like the first attempt to like take America back, like for England. And then, you know, after 1822, you start seeing more of a struggle to control the main bank in America. And so there was like a first national bank, which was sort of founded by Alexander Hamilton. And these national banks is like what these, the Illuminati, these bankers want is like, they want to have a national bank in every country. And then they want to have like a global bank so that they can control everyone's finance. So, I mean, America's whole history pretty much before the federal reserve can be seen as this struggle to form like a national bank that's controlled by this global power structure, which is sort of has the Rothschilds at its head, but really has like the Vatican at its head. So you see like we had a first national bank, 
And the first two banks we had had 20 year charters. And after that 20 year charter was up, like the bank was created as a response to a war to pay off debt. And then after the 20 years was up, the bank's supposed to expire. And all like the patriots in America were like really happy when these banks would expire and like did not want another one. But then like the globalist bankers will come in and be like, you need a new bank. And so they would start a new war with us so that we'd have debt again. And so that's basically the history of our country is, you know, after the war of 1812, we had to create the second national bank to pay for like the debt from that. And then after that charter expires, lo and behold, we have the civil war. And so it's pretty clear. I'm not completely sure how or like through what exact means, but it's pretty clear to me that the civil war was mainly about this bank trying to like get into our country. Bro, you know what that, that war was about? Big shout out to in the matrix. He's the one that first put us onto pay sewers and Q ended up confirming pay sewers that they are basically, uh, kind of like Rothschild's like an extension of them, like, um, uh, almost like a Mo- JP Morgan type thing. And these pay sewers, uh, they gave, they changed one of their names of their descendants to Springs. And that's who gave birth to, um, uh, Abe Lincoln. Boom. Abe Lincoln is actually a pay sewer. And it was over, not, it wasn't even about slaves, bro. It was about pay sewers and, and uh, Rothschilds. Yeah. Pay sewers yeah. Were north and, and Rothschilds were south. Wow. Thank you. I should probably add pay sewers to this map at some point, like connected to Abe Lincoln. Cause yeah, it was, it was more of a war between banks than slaves. Right. More knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. Pay yeah. Sewers. The pay sewers, so they control just about all the assets in America. They control uh, the United States of America. What's what's the actual name of the corporation? Because they created the corporation and they bought it with the uh, was it the Carolina? No, the like, no the Virginia Company. Boom. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Company. Yep, they own the Virginia Company, the railroads, and they used the Virginia Company to buy out the country when it was uh, turned into a corporation. Yes, well, you've definitely filled in some bullet points for me there. Like, I think those would be good ones to add surrounding this, the U.S. Civil War, which, you know, ended with Lincoln being assassinated. And there is evidence that Lincoln was assassinated by Jesuits because after he was assassinated, the U.S. cut their ties with the Vatican. And um, it was because there was so much like anti-Vatican sentiment from having our president assassinated by what, you know, insiders thought was the Jesuits. So after he's out of the way, I guess so he would be backed by the Paysors, and then it's like the, the way is basically cleared for the Rothschilds to move in. And they then you see the Act of 1871, which changed the United States from uh I guess you would call it like a republic into a corporation. And I think probably then like that corporation would be like kind of in a way under the ownership of the queen of England. And just basically after that, it like things have fallen into line for them to establish the federal reserve. Um, the last thing they had to do before they could establish the federal reserve was kill off the industrialists that opposed it, which is why they sunk the Titanic killed off. I think like Astor and like a few other of these like really important industrialists who opposed the federal reserve. And so after that happened in 1912, the way was completely clear for the actual Federal Reserve to be established. So that's 1913. And that's actually when this timeline originally ended, (laughs) was with that establishment of the Federal Reserve, because like at that point, it was like USA was under the control of this power structure and that everything was in place for the whole 20th century to unfold. And, you know, both these World War I and World War II were necessary wars or even necessary power struggles but that's just how this this power structure like enriches itself even more and consolidates even more resources for itself and they get the added benefit of all these human sacrifices which are basically sacrificed to bail even in even in war you know they don't care about human life like they that's their pleasure is to sacrifice these people. And it's, they get a sick pleasure out of it because, you know, in their private life, they're, they're sacrificing children and drinking the blood anyway. 
so that pretty much takes us through. I mean, I I basically filled in more points to just like fill up the rest of the map, but that's like the main the main gist that I wanted to get across. I mean, I've added in Bilderberg is um Bilderberg is sort of like the modern I think pretty much everyone following QAnon knows what Bilderberg is at this point, but I think like what I've read is that Bilderberg is sort of like the modern front for the Illuminati. And so that's clearly like an organization that is controlling world affairs like from a global standpoint that's like completely infiltrated by the Illuminati, the Freemasons. Yeah, it's cr- created by them. It's basically just like the Council of Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. Yeah, I didn't want to get into too much of like the 20th century like right. structure on this map because it, 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 it originally ended with the Federal Reserve. But then, like I said, I just filled in this space with, you know, more points that just confirm the thesis, confirm that there is like this shadow government or whatever, a global government that's run out of Switzerland, controlling the USA and controlling the whole world. And hopefully that's what we're defeating with QAnon. When QAnon talks about, um, you know, these people are sick, a cult controls the world. Um, I actually just did a meme of QAnon saying that. Where, Where did it go? Well, here's here's the original. Um, if you want when, to take a go, for- yeah. When QAnon said the cult runs the world, fantasy land, the world is fighting back, destroying the cult. I mean, that's pretty much the gist of that post. That's what I. That's why I saved it and you know shared it because that's that's kind of like the what this map is a proof of that a cult does run the world. That is this ancient cult of Baal, Sephiroth or pharaonic death cult. That's what Q is referring to. And, um, you know, it's even more proof. I don't know. I think I've already talked to you guys about this, but that they just had that cult of, or um, Arch of Baal is on like a traveling tour and just went through DC. And so this thing has been touring since before Trump came into power. Like it was in New York in 2016. And it's basically a, a recreation, a 3D print, a marble 3D printing of, hold on, let me just find it to drop it in here. When, uh, after you don't that, uh, if you want to take a look at the folder underneath the boom room, some questions and uh, see a couple that you might not have answered yet and uh, try to answer those, that might be a good way to uh, finish out too. Oh, sure. Yeah. So I just wanted to show like this, the picture slash meme I did of this Arch of Bale that, They've been toting through the world like it's been in London, it's been in New York, and now just like two weeks ago, it was in D.C. on the National Mall. And this is a 3D printing of the Temple of Baal (laughs) um, from, I guess it was in Syria, that they are just touring around the world and like acting like they just want to like preserve this historical artifact when it has has complete significance to like their true religion of these elites who are... um, Satanist, like bill worshippers, whatever you want to call it. What's the What's missing, missing keystone? Me? Yeah, there's a missing keystone. There's probably some kind of like satanic like bust like hanging out of there. But for me, like seeing this arch of bail like in Washington D.C., like right when I'm like finishing this map and getting ready to release the posters and like lining up interviews, I was just like, "How is this? It's like almost too coincidence to be possible that." you know, they're putting like on display, like the most obvious example of the fact that they really are the cult of Baal, like by putting this right in the middle of DC with like the capital like framed beneath it. It's just like, come on guys, like can you make it more obvious? And that's something we like to call synchronicity. Yeah, like a major synchronicity. Boom. So we do have a few questions for you. Do you agree that Baal, Baphomet, Satan, Lucifer, and other names all refer to one demonic de- uh, entity? Or how do you see it? Why so many names? Well, I definitely think that like Lucifer and Satan refer to two different entities, and that also even Baphomet is sort of a different entity. There's actually a separate little, um, what do you call it, like archetype for the Baphomet, which there was a Egyptian one that was like the goat of Mendez that had a similar name to start with a B. Hold on, let me just pull it up for myself. I need to look at it myself too, because I don't I like I just finished this part of the DD chart before I um 
you know, before I uploaded the poster. So it's kind of new to me as well. And I just discovered that the Greek deity um, Pan, like while I was in Greece, I was like seeing their little Greek like souvenirs and stuff of this, this thing that looked like the devil. I mean, it's like a little man with like goat feet and he has horns and he has a giant penis <laughs> sticking up even in these little souvenir souvenirs that um, little statues and stuff. So I was like, who the fuck is Pan with this huge penis? I was like, this is like the devil. But yeah, like, I mean, it looked like the devil, but this, it was, he wasn't like, a, had, didn't have such a negative connotation in the Greek culture. I mean, I think, he, I don't exactly know like what he represented. You know, they had a lot of gods, but, um, you know, he wasn't like the devil archetype, but it's like clearly that this is like the origin of Baphomet. And there was also, you know, this Egyptian god, I'm not even going to try to say his name, Baned Bajibimet. <laughs> I think his also his name is also the goat of Mendez because Mendez is like an Egyptian thing that was also sort of the origin of Baphomet. So, I mean, Baphomet's all, definitely like more of like a male deity, but he's not he's not the same as the storm god. That's what I'm saying. He's more of like a I think more of like either like a pleasure or like I'm totally guessing, but <laughs> he's not like the typical storm god. So yeah, to answer that question. I would say no. I would say, you know, Satan is more like the sky storm god. Um, Baphomet's like another, a different male archetype that's associated with slightly different um, things. And that Lucifer is more of the feminine archetype and is associated with more of like the earth and Venus. Boom. How do you reconcile that from the Gnostics to present day Protestants that they're Christians and yet Satan is? Let me see. How do you reconcile that from the Gnostics to present day Protestants that they are Christians and yet they are Satanism? I think this is going back up to the top of how do the present uh, how do the present day living Rothschilds fit in? Was there role today in relationships to the Clinton the Clintons and Hillary a witch, or is she just uh, yeah? Because then she said the same um, question. Definitely a witch. <laughs> I think you know they have an important role, but they're not the the rulers of the world. You know they they've been given a role to play, and you know I think you know this is like a free will universe. Like I said, or like 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 most of us know or have heard in like the you know metaphysical discussions. This is a free will universe. You know, five D definitely talks about that. So, you know, like the Rothschilds, they could probably throw a wrench in the system if they wanted to, because they do have a lot of power. But, you know, they, they also have people they report to. So, you know, they probably have the autonomy to make some moves. Like they may do a power grab against one group or another, but they're not at the top of the power structure, in my opinion. Yeah, I don't think so either. I definitely think there's a shadow uh, group that's pulling the strings behind, behind them. And they're just kind of the public name because there's, like I said, Pesurs, which have a lot more power. And I think this is something to Q was referring to, where he says, you know, the internet and stuff has hurt their ability of control and their ability to hide. Uh, and that uh, groups like that are really the ones that were in power behind these Rothschild groups. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, maybe so. I mean, even in that like civil war, if you were saying like the Pesurs were behind the Lincolns and like they were fighting the Rothschilds, which were behind the South, you know, I think it's probably more of a situation where like both these banks are working together to like have their war, have their human sacrifice and gain more control, like a deeper control over the whole territory of the United States. So yeah, that totally makes sense. And then uh, one more question is, can you elaborate on 1776 and George Washington being aware of the Illuminati plan, the design of Washington DC covertly? So this is something I'm a little bit still like, unclear on. I mean, I do think that our founding fathers had good intentions, even the ones that were Freemasons. And, you know, clearly, I, I sort of skipped over this, but like the L'Enfant plan is like the the street layout of Washington, D.C. that some, this a man whose last name was L'Enfant came up with. Now, <laughs> I, I know like nowadays we might see some ties between him and James Oliphantus with like the Pizzagate thing. You know, he's calling his names like the 
l'enfant, which means like the baby. So that's a little bit creepy that, you know, someone whose name is like the baby created like the, the floor layout of Washington, D.C. or the street layout. But I just haven't seen like that much evidence. I mean, in the George Washington Memorial, it did say that he had only been in the lodge like maybe like two or three times in his whole life. So I think his involvement with Freemasonry has been exaggerated a lot um, posthumously. But you know, there may have been some founding fathers that were like Illuminati Freemasons, and there may have been other founding fathers that were just regular Freemasons. So, I mean, I think a lot of us have heard, you know, there was a certain percentage of founding fathers who were Freemasons, but no, I don't think anyone's really heard like a, an accurate number of how many founding fathers were really Illuminati or not. You know, I've heard some other rumors about Benjamin Franklin that like, a bunch of bodies were discovered in his house when he when he lived in England for a while. So there's definitely some signs that there may have been corruption early on. And like Alexander Hamilton, for one, is the one who first sold out the USA to establish the first national bank. So clearly Alexander Hamilton was either Illuminati or working for the Illuminati at that point. Um, and so it's kind of ironic now that New York has this big Broadway production now, like praising um, Alexander Hamilton and having everyone worship him when he was really like the first early American that really like hardcore sold out our country to these globalist bankers. So that's ironic that that play is going on and that all these New Yorkers are like obsessed with him and think he's like a cool like rap star now. But yeah, so definitely I think I think there's definitely enough evidence like just from our constitution, the way it's written that a lot of these founding fathers did have good intentions at heart and like were not part of this like satanic cult, but that there was infiltration even from the beginning to some extent. Boom. Boom. Bro, you killed it. So uh, give them your information so they can figure out how to follow you on Instagram, Twitter, uh, you know, your website. Yeah, definitely. So my website is deepstatemappingproject.com. Maybe we could like pull it up in the in the screen share just to show people. Uh, oh, yeah. I just released actually yesterday the Cult of Bale poster. So that's really exciting. Um, I think a lot of people are really anticipating it because some people have heard me on Leak Project talk about it and you know, people have seen the Sephiroth map since April. And um, so now I have posters for the, the Cult of Bill and for the Sephiroth. And they both look pretty badass. <laughs> um, you know, the Cult of Bill map definitely is intended to be as a poster because the font is so small, it's even smaller than the Q-Web that I always intended it to be like a 36 by 24 poster. Um, so that's really like the way it's intended to be like red. And the Sephiroth map just looks great. It's like black and red. <laughs> um, so yeah, check out deepstatemappingproject.com and then in the info section of Deep State Mapping Project, which is part of the navigation bar, the info, you can look at the individual web pages I've made for the Cult of Bale and the Sephiroth and look at the other images and research I've done. Um, and then, of course, my main meme sharing and sharing platform is instagram where my username is master conspiracy based on the comedy central skit that was trying to like make a mockery of the q web so master conspiracy on instagram and then on facebook i have a deep state mapping project group that i would love everyone to join to be part of the discussion and share articles um share information in that group deep state mapping project the group so just join you'll be approved <laughs> and I think that's about it. Yep. So not as not only is he a fabulous map maker, but he also is a great graphics artist. Uh, comes up with dank memes all the time. So make sure you want to catch those two and uh, follow him on those different platforms. Pick up posters; they're fabulous, and check out his websites. He has a lot of information, documented sources, and stuff. And Dylan's just a great guy. We love having him here on Conspiracy Fact Press. Thanks again for being here with us. And love the interview, bro. Thanks for joining us again. We'll see you here soon, especially if you come up with another map. So see you soon, bro. Just want to give a shout out to conspiracyfact.press. You guys are really getting a great catalog of interviews going on your channel. And I just want to point out to people that hey, anyone who has not listened to the 5D interviews we did, 
like go back and listen to those because those were really great. The interviews with 5D Awakening Consciousness. I feel like they're kind of like hidden gems on YouTube right now. Like not enough people have seen those or heard the, the Great Awakening map explained. So after you get through this one and you're all depressed and you think there's a bunch of Satanists ruling the world, like go look at the Great Awakening map and you will um, see the positive timeline in our future in which we take back the world from these Satanists and, and build a better one. Let us know what you think in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Click the notification bell to get all of our content as soon as it comes out. Check out the other platforms we're on, including Patreon, where you can leave a monthly donation, or PayPal, where you can just make a one-time donation if you like the channel and you'd like to help support us.